going to be another exciting night of Potluck University. And uh, it is our pleasure to have this time Arek, who is a nuclear physicist at MIT, um, working on various non-proliferation issues. He's going to tell us about living in the nuclear age. Continuing, I would say, a very fine tradition, because I should tell you that uh, Zillard, who was a physicist who basically is responsible for the nuclear age uh, to a very large extent. He was a Hungarian Jew who had enough of Europe and he escaped very quickly from, from Europe and actually was the first man to understand that nuclear reactions were possible. Um, he, besides being a nerd, he at the same time fully realized the repercussions of his understanding, that is to say, he was not under any kind of illusion about what this means, and he was very fully cognizant that this is going to change history. In fact, he and his friends, who ultimately uh, went to Einstein and uh, started the Manhattan Project that built the first atomic bomb, they, uh, they in fact had this idea that once everybody has the bomb, there will be no more technological war. Of, you know, advanced societies. I mean, they understood that right away. It wasn't like they were under some kind of illusion, working just a, afraid of Hitler. They actually thought about non-proliferation immediately after they started working on the bomb. And they went to Churchill and they went to Roosevelt to talk to them about it, but they didn't listen at the time. But luckily, we have people like Areg who are now helping us navigate the. Mm -hmm. The nuclear age. That should be good. Sure. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Ami. Uh, I just I just learned a few things while you were telling the story. <laughs> although I had heard about it. But, uh, um, okay. So I'll give uh, just just before I go, we'll do about forty five minutes, fifty minutes, and then we'll take a break. People can drink, eat, dance, and then we'll get back and come go back to this topic and talk about some more. Um, let me try to get the focus a bit better and move it. Yeah. All right, it's just the best I can do. Okay, so what am I going to talk about today? Is my thing working? Is it not? Oh, there we go. Okay. So I'll first start off talking about the general history of the nuclear, of the nuclear bomb, how it was invented, at Man the Manhattan Project, who were people, and why did people... We know why the countries wanted the bomb. But the question is, why did the scientists work on the bomb? Okay, because scientists very often had very different agenda from the, their respective government. And then I'll, I'll go into some quasi-technical discussion. I'll keep it very simple. The biggest formula you'll see will be an exponential. Is nuclear weapons, how do they work? Okay, And there's two types of weapons, just nuclear fission weapons and thermonuclear weapons. Okay. Do you like being interrupted, or do we keep our questions to the end? Mm, that's a good question. How do you guys do it typically? We interrupt. You interrupt? Okay, okay, okay. Well, let, let's, let's keep it to the minimum, otherwise we will go on for, for more morning. Because I give very long answers. <laughs> so, but yeah, definitely. So clarification question. <laughs> yes, clarification and yeah. Um, and then actually history of this nuclear arms race and where we stand today. Okay? What's the current status? What's going on with Iran and Korea? Because a number of people asked during the poll, you know. And what's the nuclear chain of command, which is a topic that has really come to the fore recently with Trump in, 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 in power. And the question that someone asked during the poll that I li really liked is how to live with this knowledge? What do you do with this? Okay. And I'll talk about different areas that I, I work in where you can actually have, as a technologist, can actually have some impact on this problem. Okay. And I'll still talk about one project I'm working on which is like treaty verification, where we use physical cryptography to authenticate warhead as a way of uh, achieving treaties where you can target nuclear warheads themselves. But let's do, you know, let's like, as they say, you know, uh, one homicidal maniac at a time. So let's start off with the bomb. So the Trinity, so the, the Manhattan Project was uh, essentially this, this massive project that took place during World War II in the United, in the United States, which involved uh, some like hundreds, if not thousands of scientists from the United States and from Europe, okay, working on the development of the nuclear bomb. Okay. So they did their first tests in, in New Mexico in the summer of 1945. The original idea came, as, uh, as I mentioned, by Ar uh, Albert Einstein and other, other people. 
Um, the actual test took place on J June 16, 1945. And essentially, they de detonated this object over here. There's a guy sitting over here, so you can sort of see its relative uh, size, an experimental bomb. And the energy of the explosion is typically measured in TNT equivalents. TNT is a type of conventional explosive, like a plastic explosive. So this bomb is equivalent to 20,000 tons of conventional explosive blowing up. Okay. Some, some of the names that of people that work on this, essentially every single luminary of physics and mathematics contributed towards the development of this bomb. Okay. These are the list of the Nobel Prize laureates from the United States that either got the Nobel Prize before or got afterward. Okay. There are some couple of names like Niels Bohr and Rico Fermi, which were like really the founders of 20th century physics, and all of them contributed to the same. Yes? So this was uh, supposedly the first nuclear explosion. Is, yes. that the, is it the absolute minimal power of, of possible nuclear explosion? Uh, you can achieve some... much lower powers. With the modern bombs, you can go down to 10 tons of explosion. From 20 kilotons to 10 tons. Well, I'll, I'll talk about that too. A couple of people, Wigner Feynman, Norman Ramsey, who developed later the atomic clocks, which allow the GPSs in our cell phones to work and things like that. In Nazi Germany, you know, Werner Heisenberg, you know, got a Nobel Prize order. And USSR, Andrei Sakharov in the 40s and 50s really developed the first thermonuclear uh, bomb. So the, after they did the first test, they mm -hmm. actually really weaponized this device and dropped it on Japan. Two bombs were dropped on Japan and with killing about 200,000 people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Okay? And there were two weapons that were dropped, little boy, the fat man. Okay? And that essentially triggered the arms race because Russians quickly, Soviet Union developed the, the bomb, and then British developed the bomb, but then Chinese developed the bomb, but then Indians, the Pakistanis, Israel, uh, you know, France, I mentioned too many. Like, so it really started this arms race because since one person has the bomb, everyone else wants to have the bomb to us uh, for a variety of reasons. So why did, let me just go back to the slide. So why did all these scientists contribute to something like this? Many of the scientists were not Americans. Many of them were communists or communist sympathizers. Oppenheimer himself led the project, okay? His uh, mistress was a card-carrying communist, and his brother was a communist, and he was a very liberal person. Why these people developed the bomb, and why did they give it to the United States, which incinerated 200,000 civilians in Japan? There was a poll which was done about the time when the bomb, bomb was dropped <coughs> among scientists to see how many of them supported doing something like that. And only 15.15% of the scientists who worked on the Manhattan Project supported dropping the nuclear bomb on a civilian city. Okay. Most of them believed that it would be used against, at the very least against military, but maybe do a demonstration in the field to scare the hell out of Japanese for them to surrender, things like that. And many of the scientists were extremely upset about this thing. In fact, many scientists in this project ended up cooperating with the Soviet Union, they started, they transferred lots of uh, secrets and things like that. So the short answer for this thing is that because they were not worried about Japanese, because they were uh, scared that Nazis would get there for the first. And Nazis had uh, Werner Heisenberg, who was a Nobel Prize award, who was one of, you know, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, who was working on this thing, and they were all scared and worried, okay, they feared that, he, that Hitler would get there first. And when you read Sakharov's biography, Okay, Sakharov was anything but a communist. Again, this, the Soviet program was led by Zildovich, by Sakharov, by Kag uh, no, Kaganovich, by um, uh, um, huh? no, Beria was the administrator. Kurchatov, of course, Alekhanov. But most of these people were not communists. Sakharov was openly refused to enter the Communist Party in 1948, where people, for something like that, they were being sent to gulags. Okay. Why did Sakharov give a weapon to Soviet Union? If you read his biography, he makes it very clear because they were worried that Americans would do to so to Soviet Union, to Russia, what they had done to the Japanese. They were they were fearing similar outcome. Why did Chinese develop the nuclear weapon? Because they were worried about Soviet and American weapons. Why did Indians develop it? Because they were afraid of Chinese. And the history of the nuclear weapons in general, at least in its inception, is very much related to fear. People being worried that somebody else will use it against. Them. Okay, we'll come back to this a bit later. Did they all develop it? Basically, just the there were lots of the programs were related to each other. The British program was directly connected to the American program. Americans and the, uh, the uh, British essentially worked together. In fact, the implosion design I'll talk about later was actually given the concept of imploding things was given to the Americans by the Brits, and the Brits also got the British also got the same uh, knowledge and developed their own program. Uh, French developed it mostly from scratch. Uh, the Soviet Union got some secrets from uh, from the United States. 
Um, but some, some information was transferred back and forth. The Pakistanis, for example, got a lot of technology from the Chinese. So are you yeah. saying that Soviets needed those secrets uh, and would have not had the weapon otherwise? No. Or? I, I don't specialize in parallel universe. So I, 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 or <laughs> the, I, don't, I don't know. Embellishments of the bomb. But no, no, the concept of implosion. So, so okay, these are not clarification questions. So let's keep it forward. But just very quickly, the concept of implosion did not exist among Soviet scientists. They use the word implosia because they did not have the concept of import. So no, they really benefit a lot from whatever they got from the, from the Americans. Okay, so what's the basic physics behind the nuclear bomb? Okay, so there's a group of elements on the bottom of the periodic table known actinides. Okay, this involves californium, uranium, plutonium, neptunium, thorium, which have an interesting property. They have, they are, they are, they are essentially this big nuclei, large nuclei that are quite unstable. If you breathe on this nucleus, it will break up. If you hit it with a neutron, it will break up. If you hit it with any particle, it breaks up into two pieces. Few things happen in the process. Two things happen in the process. When this nucleus break up, breaks up, it releases lots of energy. Okay, quite a bit of energy, like mega electron loss of energy, which I always describe. Later. But the second thing that happens, it you release also a couple of neutrons. This neutron, just like this incident neutron, can go now and hit other nuclei and get them to split in a process known as fission. And this process keeps happening, that happening, you happen, and at every stage you are releasing more neutrons and more energy. Okay? So this basic concept is called chain reaction, where one step, one reaction releases enough, let's say, products to trigger the next step of the reaction, which releases enough products to trigger the next product of the reaction. Okay? Um, the difference, so, so there's many reactions, there's chemical reactions, there's nuclear reactions. The main difference between chemical reactions, which are occurring around us all the time in our body, you know, where we have carbon binding with oxygen. It, so you take a carbon molecule, take an oxygen molecule, they bind together, okay, because of very kind of electrostatic effects, you end up releasing some kinetic energy, which is in an order of electron volts. You don't need to know what electron volt is, a unit of energy. You think it's like most volts from because is on an energy scale of electron volts, two, three electron volts. Optical light is three electron volts, blue light. Most of this chemical reaction involves 10, 10 electron volts, nothing else. When you have something like this happen, the energy released is in mega electron volts, million electron, uh, electron volts. So the energy scale of energy released in a nuclear reaction, because the nucleus is so tightly bound, and like, you know, because the nuclear forces are so much stronger than electrostatic forces, okay, the amount of energy released is 100,000 to a million times more okay, than the energies released in chemical reactions. That's one reason why a nuclear weapon is as powerful as it is. That's one reason why into nuclear reactions we can generate enormous amount of energy that would be very difficult to produce using conventional fossil, you know, burning, wood burning and stuff like that. Okay, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So how would you use this to make a nuclear bomb? So if you have a small piece of uranium, okay, so this is where, what I showed were uranium nuclei, and you've got a neutron coming in, it might or might not cause, it's a probabilistic process. Meaning sometimes it will do it, sometimes it won't do it. Some neutrons will zip right through, something will come, hit with a nucleus, you get this fission that I talked about, so a couple of neutrons come out, most of them are lost, one of them comes, causes another one, the reaction starts. Why? Because the thing is too thin. So it's kind of like you have a log and you are trying to match, you know, burn the log with a, with a little um, um, with a little spark or with a little lighter, okay, and there's just not enough energy to get it going. Okay? So you, yes, you burn the log a little bit, it turns black, but you don't cause ignition. Okay. So this is a case of a, a chain reaction. You still get a chain reaction. There is a chain, but it dies out. However, if you make this material a lot thicker, where these neutrons have nowhere to go, you're going to get a couple of fissions. You're going to get neutrons, and these neutrons are going to see lots of materials ahead of themselves. So they're not going to just escape. They are going to cause more fissions. Those are going to cause more fissions, and this problem is going to divert. It's going to become more and more and more. So instead of having an exponential die out, you're going to have an exponential rise, which essentially will translate to an explosion. Okay? This is classified, man. This? No, this is like high school. Um, so. Okay, so, but what, what, how, how is this translated to how do we use this effect? So, kind of the, the main difference between the previous slide and this slide is that in the first time I had one geometry, second time I had a different geometry. So, the geometry causes the process to be one where it exponentially decays to one that exponentially rises. So how do we 
take a fixed system and get it to go from one where it exponentially is exponentially die out to one where it is exponentially rise. So if you do a little bit of calculation and find out what is the rate at which this fission events will happen, number of these bursts that you saw over there, it's an exponential dependence. This is time, there's a time constant, there's a 10 nanosecond, and then there's this thing called k effective, k minus one. If k minus one is less than zero, it's an exponential with a negative sign in the exponent, so it's an exponential decay. Okay. So we've got some object which is, has k minus one less than zero, you have an exponential decay, it goes nowhere, it dies off. However, if you can do something to make this k minus one much larger than zero, then you have an exponential rise. Okay. And that's the difference between a subcritical assembly and a supercritical assembly. Okay. Subcritical assembly is one where this process does not go very far. Supercritical is one where it keeps increasing more and more. So that's where you have ignition, okay. where the whole thing will burn out. Okay. So uh, can you go in between? Uh, can yes, you go in yes. nice control yes. linear? Yes. That's how nuclear reactors work. Okay. I'll talk about that too. So, okay, so what does this k minus 1 depend on? k minus 1 is a parameter, physics parameter, which captures the geometry that I talked about, but also the material type. Okay. So it turns out, in order to have k minus 1 positive, you need to have uranium-235, it's an isotope of uranium, or plutonium-239, which is an isotope of plutonium. Okay. So you need to have something that's rich in uranium-235 and rich in plutonium-239. Yes? When was it known? What year this... When did people figure all this out? Yeah. 30s. Yeah. And by who? Uh, the exact person who developed this, Fermi, definitely knew this because he did the first chain reaction experiment. 1930s. 30s, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty much early on people figured this out. Ziller came up with it, but then he, he didn't know, he didn't know about the neutron. It took him a while to yeah. figure out the neutron is the magic key. That's right. Yeah. Sorry, I don't understand about the material. That is the only material that came from? No, no. There are many more, but these ones happen to be the most optimal ones. Californium has a similar property too, but the problem with Californium is that it decays very fast, generates lots of heat, very radioactive. Uranium plutonium are good for a variety of practical reasons. But they're locked open, for example? No, no, because they are very stable. In general, they are very stable. It's very easy to get them to go from very stable to very unstable. Most other materials are not, not, you know, you need to have something that sits on the shelf for tens of years, is not radioactive, does not produce heat. So the things that two things affect is material type and geometry. Basically, the pro, the material type determines the probability of those things happening. Geometry is what I showed earlier. You have more of this stuff, you are more likely to trigger this exponential rise. You have less of this stuff, you are less likely to produce this. You are more likely to get an exponential decay. Okay, so we are onto something. We want some assembly which goes from this to this. So how do we do this? Before going there, let me answer the, uh, answer the question that uh, Bersha asked, is there's two places where nuclear, so nuclear reactions take place all the time, almost, right? in general, you have, you have uh, cosmic rays coming in, they cause spallation, all kinds of stuff is going on, but two places where they are used most effectively is the bomb, okay, where this k minus one is much larger than zero, so you end up having this sharp rise, when during the explosion, and nuclear reactors where this k minus one is essentially kept at zero. Where instead of having exponential rise for exponential decay, you have this roughly flat thing, and then the operators can vary this k minus one to go slightly above zero or slightly below zero to change the reactivity. But the most well-designed reactor has made such that this k minus one is almost always stuck at zero. You can barely raise it, barely lower it. Most reactors make such that they are self-corrected. If something goes wrong, the k minus one becomes negative, the whole thing shuts off. There are badly designed reactors, we were, which do not have this property, and Chernobyl graphite moderated reactor like Chernobyl are one example of that, where there was a criticality accident where this K-1 became much larger than zero and caused a criticality accident with lots of release of energy that ripped the reactor apart. You're going to tell us what went wrong? Huh? You're going to tell us what went wrong? No. It's, it's, a, it's a, another three, another three lectures just by themselves. Do you know what was yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, it's open, all open information. And I always wondered what went wrong. I was a little bad, des bad designs, bad management, uninformed operators, uh, but primarily, primarily bad design and desire to hide known problems about the reactor by the Kurchatov Institute, which developed the reactor. And which knew that there is this instability, but they did not want to tell anyone because it was their baby. They did not want to ever want to turn. Because but they heard that because of the first of May, they wanted something by the past.
They did lots of things. They did lots of things. Okay, it's, it's, you could can you read the one sentence and say what was the flaw in the design so that I can look it up online. So you can look up positive okay. positive void coefficient. Positive void coefficient. Yes. What happens is that if the water inside it starts to boil, in most reactors it causes the reactor to shut off. Mm -hmm. So if the reactor overheats in most water pressurized great reactors, which are used pressurized water reactors, the reaction shuts itself off. In the graphite reactor, in some graphite reactors, the boiling causes the react reactivity to go up. So it becomes a runaway force. Okay. Alright, so how do we build a bomb? So one way to have a, an assembly which has this K minus 1. Much, much, <laughs> it's okay, you can always read this on Wikipedia later. It's all, all how do we make a bomb? We're making one on the ghetto. <laughs> so, so how do you get an assembly where this K minus 1 starts off being negative and then suddenly you get it to go positive? <laughs> So, remember what I talked about, that K minus 1 depends on material type and geometry. Right? So, changing material type very quickly is pretty hard. But geometries, oh, we know how to change that fairly quickly. And uh, there's other things that you need to do that extremely fast, like really, really fast, because this whole system is reacting extremely quickly. So, what we do is that we take a sphere, a hollow sphere of plutonium, not about this this big, not, not very big, and we plaster explosives on top of it. The k minus 1 is less than 0, exponential decay, it's subcritical, nothing is happening, some neutrons are coming out. Then what you do is you detonate this explosive. When you detonate the explosive, it compresses the sphere into a form which is much thicker. Okay? Quite a bit thicker. And remember what I told earlier about thin going to thick? Thin is subcritical, thick is supercritical. So at this point, because the thickness is significantly larger, this k minus 1 becomes quite a bit larger than zero. And what was before a uh, subcritical decay turns into a supercritical rise. What you do is that you shoot a neutron and this thing, this neutron triggers the first reaction and things start to completely multiply out of control. Yes? How do you make a hollow plutonium sphere? You use a cast, you melt plutonium, you pour it into the cast. Is that not dangerous? It is dangerous, absolutely. So it has this amount of... Can you buy plutonium or plasma? No. <laughs> <laughs> plutonium is not available in nature, actually. It's a synthetic material. Uranium is available in nature, but plutonium is made only in reactors. Don't do it in your mouth. So is plutonium better than uranium? What's that? Is plutonium better than uranium? It depends for what? For a bomb. Yes. If you right. if you so have the know-how to make bombs, so plutonium is more advantageous. So we we'll like plutonium. Ouch. Okay, guys, I have twelve slides. I have like fifty slides. So let's 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 keep going. We're never gonna. <coughs> okay. So you have one neutron comes in, causes like a reaction, and then now instead of things decaying out, they start to multiply pretty fast. Okay. And uh, this is the actual time scale. This is. Basically, you can do a very quick calculation and find out that in 0 0.6 microseconds, if you do this right, okay, the every single nucleus in this 6 kilogram or 4 kilogram of plutonium will undergo fission, and you'll get all the energy out of the cell. In just less than a, less than a microsecond, the whole thing will burn. Okay? Right? And this thing blows up, and you generate enormous temperatures, which are larger than the temperature of the core of the sun. Not outside of the sun. Like, outside of the sun is cold. Inside the sun, temperature is about something like 50 to 100 million degrees Celsius. And you develop temperatures about something like that. Inside. And you release a huge amount of energy because every single, not every, maybe half, nuclear undergo fission. Each one of them develops, produces MeV worth of energy, mega electron volt energy, which results in huge, huge, huge release of energy. And that's essentially the core of the bomb. What I told you is like 3% of what you need to know to making the bomb. There's a lot more complexity, how to detonate these explosives so you get this nice spherical implosion and not like the distortion, how to avoid these stabilities, which is... How do you make a cylinder? It would be easier. Cylinder has higher critical mass, so you would require more uh, plutonium. The reason sphere is good is because you end up achieving much lower critical mass. Okay, so this is one way to get things going. Turns out, the way physics works out is that you get energy if you take a really heavy nucleus and split it apart. But you can also get energy if you take very light nuclei, such as from uh, hydrogen isotopes of deuterium and tritium, and you stick them together. So it's kind of an analogy with carbon and oxygen. You take carbon and oxygen, you put them together, okay, you release kinetic energy because the potential energy in the internal energy system changes. 
And you release quite a bit of energy. You uh, release something like uh, 17.6 mega electron volts of energy. Quite a bit more than what we're releasing in, in, a, thermal, in a regular nuclear explosion. This is the kind of reaction that is uh, happening at the core of the sun, where light elements are fusing together and in the process they are producing energy, which results in lots of heat and pressure, which keeps the outer, uh, outer part of the sun suspended until it runs out of fuel and then the, uh, the star undergoes a collapse. That's also the, the basis of a, of a thermonuclear bomb, which is a weapon which is even more powerful than what I talked about. But there is one big difference between fission and fusion. In case of fission, most nuclei, they just, you start sitting on the table, most of the time they spontaneously decay. With fusion, remember what you, you remember from physics or from high school physics, that if you have two positive charges, you put them together, they repel. Yeah. So these two guys, to get them to come together, they actually are going to repel each other. So the room temperature, they would never, this would never happen. But to, for this to happen, you have to really get them to go really fast, where their speed is so high that they overcome this repulsion, they come close enough together, and nuclear forces take over, and now they stick together. So this makes fusion a lot harder to work, because you have to overcome that what's called Coulomb barrier. You have to overcome that initial barrier, and to do that, there's a couple of different ways of doing that, but one way which is done that you have to heat this up quite a bit. You have to heat it up to 100 million degrees, where the energy of this particle is such that they overcome this repulsion and come and stick together. So how do you heat stuff up to 100 million degrees using what humans have? We can use oh. uranium bomb to make right. iron bomb. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Some people have done their homework. Excellent. So what we do is the following. The way the thermonuclear bomb works, it exploits what we talked about earlier, to achieve such temperature, okay, but it's not not really temperatures. What you have is that you have what's called a primary, you have a regular nuclear bomb, and then you have this secondary, which has the elements that will fuse together and will produce energy. You detonate this bomb, okay? The bomb releases lots of X-rays, okay? When it heats up, the electrons are zipping around, hitting other nuclei, they're producing photons, which are essentially X-rays, or X-rays are photons, which then bounce off this outside uh, thing over here and compress the secondary. And the secondary one is compressed, the temperatures in the secondary go up to 100 billion degrees, and you trigger ignition. There are other designs also which will cause this, but this is the most effective design, and it has been shown that this thing can be made arbitrarily large. There is, for the, for the fission bomb, you are essentially limited to something like 20 kilograms. You cannot go anything bigger than that for a variety of reasons. Here, you can make, or you can make it as big as you want. Okay. They're like the biggest bomb dropped was one by the side bomba, which suffered on design, which was 50 mega tons. Remember that I talked about the regular bomb, just 20 kilotons of explosive? The bomb that they developed with this fortress was 50 mega tons of, uh, of yield, which was 2,000 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Can you put it in the microwave? Huh? Can you just put it in the microwave? To do this thing? Yeah. No. But microwaves are used for triggering this, in, in, for initiating this in tokamak reactors, which yeah. are essentially reactors that are trying to do this in a controlled manner. Uh -huh. yeah. So the so microwave radiation, yeah. or they have yeah. huge RF antennas that do this blast that heat up the thing the and starts to start the bomb. What about the hydrogen bomb? What's that? And when was the hydrogen bomb developed? Like just in the year or like some sort of historical context? So the, uh, the, the Americans started working on the hydrogen, they're also Thermonuclear bomb is also known as an H bomb, hydrogen bomb, really in name. During World War II, or there was Edward Teller, was one of the participants in the Manhattan Project, who actually put huge pressure on, on Oppenheimer to develop the thermonuclear bomb instead of developing it a regular, silly nuclear bomb, which is limited, it's not as good, and stuff like that. And Oppenheimer said, no, we're not going to do that. And later, Teller was extremely bitter at him. The uh, Soviet Union developed uh, the first thermonuclear bomb in, I think, the first bomb was definitely in 1952, 1953. Americans had the first thermonuclear explosion, but it was not a bomb, it was a laboratory that was detonated. Uh, the next year after that, the Soviet Union dropped the first bomb, which was a partially thermonuclear. On, on the, in the area. Huh? Yeah, 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 in, in, in the testing no, range. What do you mean partially? Because it was, uh, it, it, there was a, this whole argument, it was this design called Sloika, which was basically like a Sloika, like a cake, like layer cake, it was layers of uranium, lithium dihydride, this all this like, there was a mix of fission and fusion, fusion fuels with each other. So it was kind of like a limited design. It was different from this one and ultimately was abandoned. 
So how big are the bombs? Like most people I talk to, and I talk about a nuclear bomb, they assume well, something so powerful must be large, like the size of this building, or something like that, right? So the original bombs were fairly small by that comparison. So this is the actual Fat Man bomb, which was dropped on Nagasaki. It was five tons. It's fairly big. Okay, so this is uh, Ramsey himself writing his name down. So you said that was uranium. This was a plutonium bomb. Yeah. The, this Fat Man was a plutonium bomb, but it was a fission bomb. This is the first model, anyway, of a Castle Bravo bomb, the first deployable thermonuclear bomb. It was like 10 tons, it's huge. Okay. So, I'm sorry if I missed that, but what, what is TAC in uh, this one? I, I, I kind of have an idea what uranium is like, but uh, how do you pack hydrogen? No, so you don't use hydrogen. You, what you use is, is you have this, this chemical called lithium hydrate, which is basically lithium H2. Instead of hydrogen, you use deuterium, so it's called lithium dihydrate. Okay. So then what you do is that the two, the two deuterons, they can fuse together, release energy, and then lithium itself, it undergoes decay, produces an alpha triton, which also participates to the reaction. And the first test when they did, they neglected the contribution of the lithium, and then ended up getting a yield which was like four times larger than expected. It resulted a lot more contamination and further out than they expected, it ended up contaminating areas that were populated. It was a huge disaster because they literally forgot to include. That's they did not know about the Turkey. Or huh? what it was in the uh, was in was in in um, uh, in Pacifica, uh, in, the Pacific, in, in the Marshall Islands on the Bikini Atoll. Yeah. Uh, so this lithium hydrogen stuff is is what is a dense solid. It's a solid. Yeah. Uh, so that you can, the lithium hydrate, you can buy it anywhere, but lithium dihydrate is what you Okay, so this is how big they were. How, but how big are they now? Because it's really hard to take this bomb and drop on someone. Yeah. So this is what the bombs look like already in the 60s, not even now. This is what a regular fission bomb looks like. This thing is about 40 centimeters, 20 kilograms, it's like a bucket this big. It fits in a backpack which then you give to a special forces soldiers, they go, they put it in a mountain path, they detonate a the mountain path, or like a dam, they detonate the dam or something like that. Most of us can carry this this thing, a special pounding demolition mission. This is the first bomb that they managed to fit in artillery shell, which was this, this big. This is the same bomb over here on a recoilless rifle operated by a French officer, etc., etc. Uh, so these things are quite small. They're not big at all, but modern bombs are definitely more compact than this. So these are the fission bombs. The fusion bombs, the real powerful fusion bombs, okay, the ones that you get megatons out. This is how big they look like. Okay. This is like this is the W88 design or something like that. You can see this is the part that where the primary is, the regular bomb, and this is the part that is the second. Is it like called warhead because this thing the front of the rocket? It's the warhead, so it's the head of the of the with the delivery yeah, system, for which example, is the during the Cold War, if you like fly the rockets towards the United yeah, States, that's, that's what will be at the That's what's called the warhead. Yeah. The, the, the warhead contains this. Yeah. The warhead is more war, warhead is more than this. So yeah, this is like a test piece. There's these three people fondling this, this device. This guy is dropping it by here. This girl I have no idea what this guy is thinking the about. Wait. There's there's a really nice paper by was that? Yeah, they're all very, very excited. There's a very so how heavy is this thing now? Huh? How heavy is this? This is probably 100 kilograms. Huh? Well, there is some radiation coming out, but it's not that much. Huh? Is it responsible? Ah, so, so they, they found different ways to make things. They found out that it can make explosives a lot smaller. The reason that original bomb was so huge was because they top out lots of explosives because they did not know their explosives well now. Nowadays, there's, they very quickly developed explosive technology to the point where you just have, did you need this much explosive to compress this little steel which is what Yeah, but the optimization is in the okay, explosive, not in the core size. The core, uh, no, they did change some of the things. They changed the how you initiate the reaction to make it more efficient. Uh, but primarily, the primary, uh, the, the reason that they were able to miniaturize this bomb so much is one, the main reason was they really worked on the explosive. That was a big part of that. Do we have any other shapes that are better? Huh? Then Spear. Spear sorry, is the most optimal one. Okay. But there are, so the, for example, there were two bombs, Fat Man and Little Boy. The Little Boy was actually a different design. It was not important. Mm -hmm. It was a 
gun type where you shot one cylinder into another whole cylinder to ask your question. But they, they had to, like, that thing had to weigh like 200 kilograms, while the, uh, while the small one weighed only a few kilograms. So you, you end up spending a lot more piece of material to make non spherical designs. But, but that's possible. This thing over here is actually also non spherical design. They had to have, have this gun type where you shoot one into the other one. Wait, what happens if they drop that? On the ground? Yeah. Not much. Not you probably break it and that's it. Yeah. They, they, they don't, they are, most, they are mostly made out of some mix of insensitive explosives, which means that there's all, it's very difficult to get them off. So they have, to, they have to undergo a huge acceleration when they are being launched, right? So they're actually fairly stable, uh, stable devices. But uh, to mention all this thing, there's a really nice paper by um, this, 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 uh, this professor, I think at Brandeis, uh, Carol Cohn, called uh, Death and Sex in the World of Defense Intellectuals, which talks about the sexualization of the nuclear weapons and how like, people have, how that kind of thinking has driven to some extent this enormous arms race that runs up. At least that's what she does. Okay. <laughs> I, I guess they have all heard the word. Yes. 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 I can, I can send you the paper. It's, it's a very, it's lots of fun. That's, that's the movie Doctor Strange Love. Mm -hmm. No, there, there's also Dead Doctor Strange Strangelove, but she specifically analyzed how these aspects of humans, let's just put, put it that way, affect their perception of the bomb and the need for the bomb. Yeah, but that's the whole point of the movie Doctor Strange Love. It's no, all no. about the male. Yes, you know. yes, yes. There, that's right. There's, there's many treatments of this problem. Okay, let's keep going. This is, so these ones are actually real warheads, which are being, you know, QA'd and things like that. Um, okay. QC. QC? Quality analysis, quality assurance, okay. I don't know, quality control. Okay, okay so... What's the thing with QA? Why is it like Because they break down with time, so they have to constantly have to check to see if their parts are still functioning and things oh, like that. Like that. Because the six-pointers are all plastics, right? They, 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 yeah. they crack, they crystallize, and uh, they have to replace them. Just like burn, how they check like the I don't know. I don't know. Smell it. They x ray that probably. Um, okay, so making the bomb is one thing, but the second part of things you actually have to, if you want to launch it at someone other than yourself, you have to use a delivery system. Okay. And the delivery systems themselves are that's a big part of the technology development that made the whole nuclear weapon a usable weapon. So how do we deliver weapons against each other? Uh, there is three, there's this triad that people talk about. The main one is this intercontinental ballistic missile. They're called intercontinental because this it's expected theory, to watch. Right? Huh? This is all theory. Theory? Yeah. No, it's our picture. I, no, I know. <laughs> it's not like it happened. I hope, I hope. No, it's a real thing. It's 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 a, it's a real thing. So what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if they build it, but they never. I mean, they it's just got. It. <laughs> no, yeah, it, it's. It works. It works. It works. It works. It works. No, it works. No, no, they, very well. They, 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 them. they can aim, they can pitch a top of the mantle cover for 9,000 kilometers. Oh. This one in the future set is that shield. Really? Yeah. Yeah. No, they did. The deliveries are being tested all the time. They're being tested all the time. But the. Um, Fortunately, they are being only tested and not actually used. So, so, so the ballistic missiles, they can, no, that they are typically kept either in, in this extreme, there's two ways to keep this, this missile. One of them is either in a known location, deep underground, not very deep, but in a silo, which is well protected from external attack, or you can put it on a truck, like the Russians do, and drive them around by gas so that the enemy does not know where they exactly are. Okay, that's one of two ways of protecting them. They can be also, the early way of, launch, of, of, of deploying them was using strategic bombers. Okay, so bombers that can go 6,000 kilometers. Americans have their B-52s, Russians have their uh, this Bear Su 170s. And later people developed the submarine launch ballistic missile, which can be shot from under the water. Okay. So here's a couple of things. What are the actual times it takes from the launch for the actual warhead to hit the ground and detonate? It, depending which delivery system you are talking about, it's something like 30 minutes. 
So, so what's the what's the problem with this? From life to detonation. For what difference? Huh? Yeah. For the body in intercontinental ballistic missiles. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's also intermediate range uh, ballistic missiles which were banned because their arrival time was eight minutes. Okay. But so why is this a problem? It's a problem because you have this whole concept of deterrence. You have got two countries, okay, that the only way we know that the Russians will not bomb us is because we they we the Russians know that if they try to bomb us, we'll bomb them back. But if they're going to bomb us and destroy all our government, destroy all our structures, destroy all our command, destroy the ICBMs and things like that, then they might be able to win a nuclear war. No, because we're so, united with them. So, the... <laughs> we are the Russians. <laughs> yes, 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 let's, come on. Sorry, I'm a little serious. Come on, let's, let, let, let's stick to the topic, because seriously, there's so much stuff to cover here. Yes. When you're launching something in the device, um, something like you actually need a um, like building the ground thingy you to do from what? which you're gonna launch it, as yes. in instead of the movable um, transport uh, storage, That's right. if you're gonna need to leave salvage somewhere and launch it, are you so so it? most of the time these warheads are inside these things all the time. So it's already ready. So there's different degrees of readiness, like United States. I'll go into this later. So I'll, I'll talk about okay. it. I'll talk about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but the main problem is that the two countries have very little time to respond. Like Americans have, actually have extra time. The moment that the Russian ICBMs come up, American infrared uh, satellite immediately see them, and then it takes about five minutes for the signal to be validated, and five or ten minutes later, the president finds out. And the president has five minutes to make a decision because it will take another 10 minutes once he or issues the order for the order to result in an actual launch of the ballistic missiles. If they are late, our ballistic missiles will be destroyed, we'll lose our deterrence, and so it cannot be. Because if, if the Russians get a wind that it takes us longer than 30 minutes to respond, they will actually think that, yeah, we can do this, and that, will, that itself will increase, increase the probability of nuclear war. So the reason nuclear war is being kept in bay is because both sides are on the trigger constantly. They have very fast response times. If the other one shoots, we will shoot before the bullet hits us. That's that's the whole concept of deterrence theory. Hmm? To to make you mean to make it larger, hopefully, you make it reduce it, and the whole thing becomes hopeless. To to increase it. So so there were so there were so so, so let me ask you. So there were other ballistic missiles called intermediate range ballistic missiles. For short of this, is, the arrival time was eight minutes, and people really saw those missiles as a real destabilizing thing because both sides at any moment could be under the attack and not have enough time to respond. So actually, Americans and the Soviets decided to ban intermediate range ballistic missiles because so that instead of having like half a minute to respond, they have at least you know five minutes to respond, which is more safe. <laughs> but but, but, I'm, but what I'm getting to is the notion that you have this very unstable system where people have to make quick decisions and they really don't have time to think. They have to make decisions under duress, under stress. There is very little opportunity to validate and to verify and things like that. And that results to the risk of accidental nuclear war. There was a Soviet joke, who threw a felt boot on the bottom? Yes, <laughs> I've heard that joke a few times. So there have been many, many cases where essentially you have like where both sides thought that the other side is launching something at them, and at the last minute they decided no, 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 that's not the case. Stop, 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 and that saved the situation. They're like so, in some sense, we're extremely lucky to be to be alive. Yes, Carlos. So is there a possibility of of course, of course. Every time there's human. So there have been one very specific case which was not really a mistake. It was major American screw up. So in 1982, the Soviets saw a launch of a missile into the upper atmosphere, which is typically is how you would start nuclear war. You launch this thing, it's called EMP bomb, because of detonation in the upper atmosphere, it destroys all your radar systems, it destroys communications, and after that, the country does a massive attack. They, they saw this thing coming up and they were like, is this an EMP attack or is it not an EMP attack? And the guy who was sitting at the thing, he sort of decided that it's probably not a real thing and did not escalate the problem. At the time, Andropov was the general secretary, he was a really nervous guy, he did not trust the Americans. At the time, they were, Americans were doing war games in West Germany, which is typically a very suspicious thing to do in general, as we all know. Um, and the guy decided not to do it. What it turned out to be, what turned out to be a real thing. Americans were launching a scientific uh, miss, uh, rocket 
into to study the northern lights, aurora borealis. And to do that, you have to launch it to the northern, near the northern pole, you have to launch it at altitude of 300 kilometers. And the, this launch mimicked almost perfectly the launch of an EMP weapon. So it was very lucky they did not, the not react to it. Huh? They, the they did not tell the Russians anything. They didn't no, so anything. Yeah. yeah. And this guy yeah. basically saved the world. He, he just died. Saved the world. He, he just died. Like he died recently. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Was, 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 okay. They can come very close. They can launch at very flat trajectories. And basically, what I uh, have found is that the when the so these are red, you know, these uh, infrared satellites get this. At a stage where the data from infrared satellites is being validated, the bombs hit the, hit the ground. So yeah, submarines also have this, in some ways, destabilizing factor that they can, in principle, sneak in and do a surprise, a su surprise attack that you won't be ready for. Uh, so anyway, there's lots of intricacies, but basically what I'm getting to is this concept called deterrence. Basically, you prevent a nuclear strike by threatening, credibly threatening, something that people can't believe, a nuclear counter strike or retaliatory strike. Okay. There's this concept called first strike, the ability to strike first, and then second strike. So to ability to weather the first strike and then retaliate and punish the enemy for this thing. It's that notion of punishment that essentially keeps two sides from destroying each other outright. Or starting a nuclear war hoping to win it. So what's the extent, how much, what's the power of this nuclear bomb? What is the destructive power of this nuclear bomb? I sort of use numbers like 20 kilotons, stuff like that. So one submarine, let's focus just on submarines, let's forget about this ICBM. Submarines have the smaller part of the, of the, uh, of the ballistic missile uh, forces. One submarine, okay, missile, that this guy over here, right on the tip over here, it has something like 10 nuclear bombs that independently can be targeted. The combined energy that they can release is 6 million tons of TNT. Now, is this a lot or is this little? During World War II alone, we used only 3 million tons. So one missile carries twice the explosive power of all explosives from World War II. Just one missile. An Ohio-class submarine has 24 missiles. So a Swan submarine has 50 times more destructive <coughs> power than all the explosives used in World War II. Now, the United States and uh, UK Russia have 20 submarines. They can sort of do this mathematics. 50 times 20 is what we're talking about, so like thousand just these submarines a thousand times more destructive power than all of the explosives used in World War II, which killed 50 million people. Not that explosives just killed only a small part of it, but nevertheless. So how many deployed warheads are there? But what does deployed mean? Deployed means ready to fire. This is a question that you are asking. There's lots of weapons that are deployed on actual delivery systems, ICBM, bombers, etc. And there's ones that are in the reserve or in the store pile. So that's why I have a concept called hedge also. Um, so what is the thing that kills people in, in, during the during nuclear war? The original strike, the actual blast and the firestorm, kills some amount of people. But the real, the real effect that kills people is a nuclear fallout. Because what happens is you have an explosion that activates lots of earth. Okay, it makes it very reactive. It picks it up. This mushroom cloud picks it up, throws it in the upper atmosphere, and then that stuff goes and falls down on cities and where people live. Okay, and that kills. So just from nuclear fallout and blast and you know and fire, if there is a full scale nuclear war, we're talking about twenty million deaths just from that. Two hundred. Two hundred. What did I say? Twenty. Two hundred. Sorry, two hundred million. But this is not all. This is yet not the main killing mechanism. What happens is that if you, depending on how the war is fought, if you bomb each other's ICBM sites, is one story. But if they resort to bombing each other's cities, you end up getting this huge super fire. This you have got this huge. Uh, firestorms, where the whole city is ignited into this massive firestorm. You end up having this, all this carbon particulate, you know, soot injected into the upper, upper atmosphere. Once it gets into the stratosphere, it's stuck there for 10 years. And it blocks off sunlight and everything. And it stays there for, for 10 years, you basically have no summer. And no day. Huh? No day. You have like some, so you'll have some luminosity, you'll have some light, of course, but yeah, it will be very big. So no, no food. No food. Uh, agriculture collapses, livestock collapses, no food, and in, especially, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. Southern Hemisphere is a different story, because most targets will be the Northern Hemisphere. And what about and these bombs that Tsar has developed, that kind of operate 
Yeah, neutron bomb does not work. A neutron bomb uses neutron radi radiation. How is different from neutron? It's a bit long to explain. I'm, I'm gonna skip that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So it's not the same. No. Neutron bomb is a, is a modified nuclear bomb which reduces the blast, makes a massive neutron radiation. Which is the purpose was not was to kill the tank crews in Eastern Europe in case of like an engagement with the, with the Soviet forces. And then it was determined that it's a completely stupid idea anyway. Um, so, so you are talking about like once that this happens, you end up having this global cooling, no, no summers. In 10 years, you have that's built. It was just for one nuclear war between the United States and, and Russia. So this is what's called mutual assured destru destruction. Yeah. Uh, huh? Radioactive well, it causes cancer. <laughs> well, depending what doses you get. Depending what doses you get. If you get like a massive acute dose, you develop ulcers, you develop very painful dose. Yeah, yes. like it's, it's, it's not fun. 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 It's radiation sickness. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what that. is well, what's wrong with Chernobyl? Well, what's wrong with the environment? Okay. And there's, and there's your Go to order. Alright, alright, guys, guys, guys. So, we're going to get into the sky or we're going to get into the sky. Let's stick to the topic. Okay, so, how many, how many weapons are there? So, I'm going to give you some more bad news and I'll give you a little bit of good news, right? So, this is like history of the nuclear, number of nuclear warheads throughout history until 1985, okay? So American startup, the blue is Americans, okay, and the Soviet Union kicks in and the Soviet Union starts really building up bombs to like 60s and stuff like that. The Soviet Union was always behind Americans in most of their uh, nuclear forces. At some point they catch, catch up, it gets to here, and then, you know, there are a couple things. There's the first US bomb, USSR starts its first detonation, Cuban missile crisis is here. And then a couple of good things happen. Perestroika kicks in, USSR collapses, a bunch of treaties, and the numbers start to really come down. And this is where we are currently. There's about 3,000 deployed water. But at the height of the, of, the, uh, of the Cold War, we had something like 70,000 nuclear warheads. Okay. What happened to them? Uh, they got dismantled, most of them. Mm -hmm. They got reduced. They got their piece got taken out. Some of the fissile material got converted to nuclear fuel. So they burned in, 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 in the things. <laughs> so, okay, so people ask me what's the current status, I put this poll, people ask me what's the current status of the nuclear forces throughout the, throughout the world. Um, so there's a different inventories in a number of countries. <coughs> so you see like 95% of the weapons are in the hands of the United States and Russia. And if you ask me why we feel that we need to have these thousands of warheads, when France and China and UK have, feel that they need only 250, it's another very long answer, which I'm not going to be sure even myself. I'm not sure I understand why historically the United States and Soviet Union felt that they needed 70,000 nuclear warheads. When other countries feel that to deter the fact they need only 200. Um, just talk about the principle of power and the language. Yeah. As well as, organizational, as well as organizational pressure. We have organizations like military who want funding. They come up with reasons why the bombs are good, why we need more bombs. And then, oh, look, this the Soviet Union, like, oh, Americans have more bombs. We can't let them have more bombs than, than we do. Um, was, there was, was, was a very interesting quote that I heard that in, in India, when India did this test in late 90s, they asked the head of their nationalist party, why did we need to do this new protest? And his answer was, we had to show that we're not Unix. Unix. Right. So there's lots of that stuff that is factored into. So it's really not a rational. There's no good rational reason. Lots of reasons are very Yes, question. How is DPRK? DPRK is Democratic People's Republic of Korea. It's an official name for North Korea. Yeah. Which has only 10. So my question, why are you so afraid of Korean nuclear attack if we have seven, like six thousand? Because if you bomb, drop ten bombs on ten largest American cities, we'll have twenty million people. So that means that there is, there is no difference if you have seven, six exactly, thousand. Exactly, that's what she's saying. Yes, yes. There is no difference. There are some differences, but at some point differences become unclear. But I'll say that, because I'm not really a theory, deterrence theorist. But if out of ten, five don't work. 
Yeah, that's that's a, exactly. That's a very good question. Is the probability of them working? Yeah, 70%. You need to know what the design is. Uh, probability of them working, depending on their is probably 90%. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of them can be shot with anti ballistic missile defense and stuff like that, but it's, it's not good. That's one of the reasons why people felt that we need to have mobile just in case. You know. So, it can be bad. Like, launch more than, like, to have this one working, you launch more than one or something? Some people, something like that, yeah. yeah. So, when I originally were choosing with Sveda Savannah, we were choosing the name of the thing, we were thinking what to call it and things like that. She came up with a name that I liked more, but one intermediate name that I had was Fear and Loathing in the Nuclear Age, which it goes something like this. We have two nuclear superpowers, 3,000 deployed <laughs> units, out of which about 1,000 on short notice launch, another 8,000 in the stockpile, and 5,000 in the reserve, a whole galaxy of various tactical warheads, SLD, MICB, etc. And the only thing that really worried me was whether we had enough bombs. <laughs> there was an, another nice analogy that I remember. Uh, has anyone seen the, the, the Day After? Yeah. It's a pretty depressing movie, but uh, when, they, when, they, when they showed it, apparently there was a discussion on NPR or something, and someone gave a very good example. <laughs> It says, you have got a room where there's two mortal enemies, a tag in the opposite quarters. The room is awash with gasoline. One of them has 7,000 matches. The other one has 8,000 matches. And they're both really worried if they have enough matches. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Yeah. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but there's definitely some wisdom in that analogy. Yeah. So one thing that is worth remembering is, you know, we are spending enormous amount of money on our uh, military. And the United States has, Obama administration has allocated $1 trillion for renovating our nuclear arsenal. So it really needs to be renovated and you know, things like that. So it happened now, not during it's, the Cold War, but now? Yes, so that's Obama. The, so, 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 it, so it, it, keeps, it, keeps, it keeps going back. There's a whole story why they agreed to that. It's not exactly because so of the war. who's the enemy now? Okay. All right. Let's so let's let's stick. Uh, okay. So I was asked. Huh? That's Ahmadinejad. Right? That's Ahmadinejad. You're guessing right. So I was also asked about to tell you about Iran and uh, Korea. I'm gonna probably skip this uh, unless people are really uh, want to know about Iran and uh, maybe I'll go straight to North Korea. No, 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 no. Okay. You have to know, you know, who is the potential target. Okay, should we take a break? <laughs> should we take a break? Yeah. I have. No. 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 Okay, right. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I have to drink that. At least, at least one. There's at least one person on this picture who is from MIT. Yeah, <laughs> that's <what I> <laughs> Yeah, this is what we're famous ask, for. Yeah. So that we listen to you, please stop questions. All yes. of us. Yes. yes please. Well, I mean, truly, let's have. Clarifying no, well, right. questions. Let's, let's have clarifying questions. questions. Because most questions you ask me, eventually I get them from my slides. So let's let's yeah. try to pull them. Okay. All right. So Iran, what's what's the deal with Iran? What's the deal of this JCPOA, which I can never remember the the, the you know, what it's an abbreviation for, and what is what what are its effects? Where are we going to get that? So, the, in, in very short, Iran had a nuclear weapon program, effectively, which was effectively significantly curtailed as part of this agreement that was signed about two years ago. And lots of people, when they hear about the uh, treaty, they sort of did not know what was going on, and they find out what the treaty is signed, and then now there's new conditions. And people, they look at it and like, wait, wait a minute, we let them have all these things? And typically the treaty, the way you want to look at the treaty, you want to see what did the treaty change? Where were we, and where are we now? Okay. So for Iran, the kind of relevant parameters that we're going to really after is the number of these centrifuges they used to have. And centrifuges are devices, it's these guys over here, for enriching uranium, for taking natural uranium and making it to the point where it's at, a, it's at a grade where it can be used in nuclear weapon, which is a very slow process, involves huge complexity. It's a technically very simple idea, but to do it well and effectively, it involves some, some sophistication. So they had 15,000 centrifuges, which is one thing, and they had about 6,000 kilograms of what I call LU, it's low enriched uranium. Think of like natural uranium, pretty much. Okay. And you have to, out of this, you have to make highly enriched uranium. And so why are these numbers important? And after wars, they agreed to cut, the, to reduce the number of their centuries to 5,300 kilograms only. And people talk a lot about breakout time. 
There's the breakout time that you run was this, now it's this, and things like that. What's this breakout time? And how does it depend on these two parameters? The breakout time is the time it takes for the country, if it decides to kick all the inspectors out, which they used to have, and start like really full-scale making uh, uranium, it's a time it takes from, time, from, from, from the start to get enough material to make one, to make one bomb, which is about 25 kilograms of highly enriched uranium. Okay. So the reason this time is important is because if that time is only one week, and if the country decides to go for to, to make a run for it, one week is not enough to react to it. Meaning countries in order to organize to or get organized, carry out a military strikes, sanctions, one week is nothing on that scale. It takes at least a month for countries in the UN to uh, agree and things like that, the plans can be laid out, etc. But if you could change this breakout time to say one year, okay, that's enough time that if the country starts to go on that route, there will be enough time to react to or get organized to come up with agreements, tear out military strikes, do economic sanctions that are deeply punitive and stuff like that. So most people have been operating in this breakout time. So what was a breakout time before the treaty was signed and what it is now? So these are plots, essentially, where on the two axes you have the number of these centrifuges, an amount of this LEU stuff that I mentioned, and for any combination, you can essentially look at what, you know, what uh, contour it corresponds to that tells you what is the breakout time. So before they signed this treaty, okay, they had 15,000 centrifuges and 6,000 kilograms, which is like all these charts somewhere over here, which translates at less than one month. Actually, the breakout time was like two weeks. If in 2014, Iran wanted to make the bomb, and if they really went for it, in two weeks, they would have 25 kilograms of uranium. And at that point, what happens is that once they have the uranium, the whole thing changes. You cannot go after them with military strikes because now they have nuclear weapons. It completely makes so things what about very huh? No, suppose they have delivery systems too. They do have delivery systems. They have developed yeah. missiles and they have aircraft and stuff like that. They could strike European capital if they really want, but first they used to Europe. So what happens after the what how, where are these numbers on this thing? So they're somewhere over here. There are about 5,000 centrifuges, 300 kilograms. This is a very pessimistic calculation that was done by my colleague Scott Kent in our department. It translates to about 10 months. It realistically, like one year. So the difference is quite large. I mean, before we were, so you know, remember that when the BB was going crazy in UN with that plot and things like that, right? The guy was actually right. The, the Iranians truly were at 90% of getting there. They were two weeks from making, you know, at least some material. They had to assemble it and stuff like that, but supposedly they had that technology lined up for it. So yeah, this was a really huge improvement in terms of the stability of things. Of course, this is not, you know, one question that people ask, but could they really make the bomb? And the answer to that is, if someone really wants to make the bomb, they'll probably do it. Because remember, the bomb, nuclear bomb, is 1940s technology. I mean, this laser pointer has probably more modern stuff than the kind of stuff you need to make the bomb. It's an old technology. Any technologically developed country, if they want to, they can do it. Okay. So the question is not so much about ruling it out. The question is to make it such that it's not advantageous for them. Where the cost of getting it is so large, it totally outweighs the reason for getting it. Yes. Sorry? Uh, it's okay. My response will be made to it. How do we know that they actually don't have a bomb? So the, the short answer is we don't. Uh -huh. But we are pretty sure. How, how do we know that Republic of Georgia doesn't have a nuclear weapon? How do you prove the absence of something? It's very difficult. But uh, there is enough certainty, there's enough confidence in the Western intelligence agencies, Western governments, that they do not have the bomb. Yeah. I mean, the step it takes to get to the bomb, nevertheless, even though it's a technological simple process, it involves significant, fairly massive, actually, industrial effort, but which is quite effective. Be, I mean, they, they will get caught. They will know when they drop so, 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 so that's a good point. The, why, why would you want to have the bomb? If you have the bomb, why would you want to hide it? The purpose of having the bomb is to deter an attack on the world. So you have to do that Ah, because Israel does not have nuclear weapons. Okay, okay. Right, keep going. All right, North Korea. Okay. So people ask me about North Korea on the on the poll. So this is a picture by this guy whose name I can never pronounce, and they are nuclear scientists. And this is another picture I like more that tells. So this is this is their device. And lots of people are asking, well, what is this? Right, sure. So so this this, this is that primary that we talked about. 
This is that thermonuclear secondary. This is a neutron generator. These are cables for explosives. And these are reentry vehicles. This is a real thing. And they did detonate a thermonuclear bomb. We know what the yield was, and that yield are the underground test. And from the yield, we know that it could not have been a regular nuclear bomb. It must have been a thermonuclear bomb. So they definitely have that technology. What complicates the situation is they also have, now they're developing delivery systems that can very soon reach the United States. No, we have the, the Raiders. I made them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you are. Okay, I know you are. Well, well, I know you are. I know you are. I know you None of them work. We tested them many times. They don't work. Yeah, they all failed. <laughs> <laughs> not your Raiders, maybe. No, no, not Raiders. They didn't fail. Anyway. So, 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 yeah, the thing is that people talk about uh, uh, ballistic missile defense, which the United States has ages while we trying to do that. And the way it turns out that the technology necessary to evade yeah. ballistic missile defense, the technology necessary to evade nuclear, uh, ballistic missile defense is typically cheaper than the ballistic missile defense itself. Historically, that's how it has worked out. Most, most weapons are like that. The, you try to build a countermeasure, and like, you know, the way to avoid the countermeasure is always easier than the countermeasure itself. Okay. Do you know the countermeasure? I mean, who's so stupid to say what the countermeasure is? And They're very simple. You, you, the, the, during the reentry, you have the reentry vehicles. You create these balloons that come out at all directions. They will know which one of them is a real bomb and which one is a, just a balloon. Right. Go on figure. Okay, so the nuclear chain of command, because this is something that people are freaking out a lot these days. So here's the thing I love a lot. So this is Obama, and you cannot see this, but this is a red button. Right? And uh, I'm going to read this to you because you can. He says, he says, I think I was closer to pressing the button today than I have ever been. Okay, let me be clear. I do not want to start a thermonuclear war, but knowing that I could at any moment and that it would be so easy, well, it almost feels like I'm being tested or something. Then he goes, <laughs> says, and then he says, did you know that if you sort of put enough weight on a button with your finger trip, you can feel a little slight before it actually clicks? <laughs> Thank you and God bless America. Of course, this is uh, something from the onion. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there is no such a thing as a red button. However, while there is no such a thing as a single button, there is such a thing as a single command. There is such a thing as one person issuing the command that will unleash the whole thing. One person. Is it what does it mean that there is no red button? So, it's, uh, so the President of the United States can, yeah. and the President of Russia, can unilaterally issue an order, and literally yeah, nobody time. can stop him to start a nuclear war. So what is this the chain of command that we talked about? Is it the same in Korea? Like, you know, other places that are actually the same, or not? So here's the thing. The fact that we don't fully know how it works. Like, even in the United States, there's lots of debate as how the order goes around. But here's a kind of a graphic that I got from Alex Wallerstein, is a really cool guy. But basically the way it works is that the president says, Newcomb, the Secretary of Defense, translates the order to the chief, uh, to the chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, which transfer uses uh, communications to get it to launch officers, and launch officers do the launch. And the final step looks sort of like this. It can't help but be like, oh, they smile. so <laughs> endearing, <laughs> too like cute, they're like, they're you know, smiling. 20 year olds, turning their switches, yeah. launching their boats to yourself, 10 million people dead. And it's all during 30 minutes, right? And this has to be done within 30 minutes. That, that's at least the operational approach to, to, to this thing. But basically, the whole thing really depends on one person. And there is lots of history as to why it has all been focused in the hands of one person. It has to do with the fact that in the 40s, the military controlled everything. Then they pulled it back from the military. Then they gave it back to the military. Then there was this whole thing that we need to be extremely fast if the Russians hit us. Uh, but if the Russians find out that we're not fast, they are more likely to hit us, and the Soviets did have the exact same thinking. And the whole thing was done such that rather than err on the side of kind of checking, verifying, you know, before pulling the trigger, they, everyone erred on the side of being extremely fast. Yeah, Pull right. the trigger and then ask questions later. Yeah, because you don't, you don't have any time. Huh? You don't have any time. Because, because you, don't, you don't have any time. Right, right, right. So, so, it's so, not that so, 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 so when I say that I don't understand the terms theory, that's yeah. exactly what I mean. Because you still have these submarines. Where even if they come and completely kill every American on the, on the surface, right? You still have the submarines that can launch an attack and can carry out a retaliation. So in principle, this whole fear and this whole kind of edginess is a little bit artificial. So, yeah. I don't fully understand that either. Yeah, submarines are previous to the MP? Uh, submarines are underwater, so yeah, they are very, very secure. Yeah. So they are hard to hit with nuclear weapons? They're hard to fly. It's they don't know where they are. Yeah. 
What about Dr. Even now? Uh, you know, yes. He's a very old officer. So, so a lot. So that that movie was quite instrumental, apparently, in implementing this thing called the PAL. Yeah, permissive well, action games, but it's, it's, yeah, but yeah. It, it, permissive action yeah. games they prevent the use of a nuclear weapon. Someone has told. Yeah. But in principle, a commanding officer, if a submarine of submarine commander decides to carry out a launch, they could do it. With a, I mean, it would be illegal, and they would get court martialed by the <laughs> <laughs> But, but, but if someone, but if a command, but if the submarine uh, commander decides to carry out a launch, they will, you know, they'll they'll do it. So people, I really don't want to compete with you in in my, well, the strength of my voice. Let's sort of you know keep keep going. Okay. All right. So one question that people put up over the year was, what kind of technology do we need to invent uh, invent to render nuclear weapons harmless? But I really like this question. My it's, question. I know it's your question. But there was another question that came up that I really really liked. It's how to live with this knowledge. When I saw this thing, I'm like, this must be someone from MIT. And sure enough, it was Leonid Mirdi. <laughs> I'll put you that. I was quite so, so uh, I think I think that so the, this question the reason I like it is because look most of us are in technology most of us are in sciences physics mathematics and stuff like that and we all have this notion that technology can solve all the problems of the world if I ask you the question what technology do we need to invent to make to make all the pens stop writing there is no such a technology okay there, there is no technology we have this notion that technology is like supernatural it will solve all the, no it's not. Some of the problems have to be solved through non-technological means. We can use technology to make a dent in this problem, as I'm doing, essentially, in my research, where we can essentially have an impact on this problem. But a significant part of this is really about humans, about how, how humans behave, and how to convince them to behave differently. Um, Facebook. There's a, there's, a, there's a nice joke that, uh, this is a very nerdy joke, but I'll interpret it. Uh, it says, uh, Archbishop uh, Gabriel goes to God and says, Hey man, do you hear? Do you remember we set up that experiment like you know five million years ago? Humans on the planet and stuff like that. It's like yeah, what's going on? Well, it's totally out of control. They've developed technologies, they've developed science, they've invented this thing called nuclear weapons. They're about to destroy each other. So God thinks like ah, don't worry, just add another nonlinear term to the QCD Lagrangian and we'll be totally fine. <laughs> so the only way to change, the only way to really change something is to change the laws of nature. But we're not going to be able to. The only way to deal with this problem is try to really be mature about this and to raise awareness in society that this is a real problem. And it's not God. The end of the Cold War did not take this problem away. We did a lot to cut down the arsenals, but what I showed you earlier, this thing over here, it's the same thing as during the Cold War. Yet the environment is very different. We don't need to be so much on the trigger. And this creates a really increases the probability of uh, accidental nuclear war. So Something that's think more that we can create war. some uh, kind of Temporary modulation of uh, environment, which which would change the way chain reaction goes. Yeah, yeah or like uh, I don't know, like uh, okay. delivery. Mess with delivery. I mean, that's obvious, right? I mean, so, all right. So, what can we do? So, first of all, we need to understand what are the problems that we're dealing with. And this is this is a slide from uh, this is a slide from uh, that I showed during my job interview at MIT. Uh, question. But, so sorry, before you move on. Yeah. Um, it's relating to the slide right before. The what? Like. My question relates to the slide right before. Okay. So you um, you point the problem to the fact of how our thinking is regarding how do we deter a war by creation of threats, right? By the right. punishment. That's right. Um, but which has been essentially the jailway in which conventional military has war. Right, right, right. right. Or, uh, yeah, okay. Most conventional right. military is made to deter an attack by right. making That was a presumption that we, were, we made at one point, correct? Yeah. We, we presented it as such. And yeah. What I wonder is, was there or is there like a parallel thinking, uh -huh. which is all about defense, because of the launch from our side and attack from? So, so this is what ballistic missile defense has been developed for. The thing about ballistic missile defense, what it does is that it it's a uh, people like to think of it as a defense, as a way of preventing North Koreans destroying us. But what it is is that ballistic missile defense, if it works, which it does not now, but if it works, it will take away impunity. It will make us immune to the punishment itself. So in a way, a ballistic missile defense is really an offensive tactic. You mean there's no repercussion if I were to do Exactly. Imagine I said it's immune to an attack. Tomorrow, there would be absolutely no reason why we wouldn't want to bomb North Korea, Russia, and so on. So it's actually a gain. Huh? So a gain actually will 
from the point of view of the United States, it's a benefit if it works. But from the point of view of humanity, I think it's, uh, it's it, can, it can be very problematic. Unless it's so effective that everyone adopts it, and then ballistic missile technology just becomes completely obsolete. In that case, you could claim that, okay, right, it, it helped everyone. But we are nowhere near that. We are still in the early phase where it works maybe 90% of the time, or not, even not 90%. Which means that the other country to make up for your 90% you just need to launch 10 times more weapons. That will make up for that. <coughs> well, it doesn't mean for it to work, you just shoot down the missile so it doesn't deliver where it's supposed to deliver, but still it, it grabs up the atmosphere and the temperature goes down. No, 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 so it's like the extended version of the you know, anti-aircraft you know, technology. Except that with anti-aircraft technology, you have very low speed, you can actually do it. With ballistic missiles, they are going at like five kilometers per second. And striking one, and, and, and you have to do this in outer atmosphere, outside of atmosphere where explosions don't work. You have to actually hit the device directly, which is extremely difficult. Okay, so if you just hit so. it afterwards in the atmosphere, it will ignite, but it will just not reach uh, New York. Like no, 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 it, it will. I mean, once it enters atmosphere, it's like you have a couple of seconds. At that point, the response time is, is negligible for actually using it. Yeah, so, so what can we do? So, so, all right, so I'm going to start with a maybe less exciting part of this talk about what technologies we can work on which actually can help some of these problems. So there's many aspects to this problem. It's not just the fact that the countries have nuclear weapons. It's the fact that some of the nuclear weapons can end up in the wrong hands, as if there is such a thing as the right hands, but whatever. So there's a big worry that you've got countries with peaceful nuclear energy programs. There's many countries that are building up nuclear reactors. China, you know, the Arabic countries, the Middle East, lots of them are building up. Brazil has plans for reactors and stuff like that. And of course, this, this, react, this uh, nuclear uh, you know, reactors can become a platforms for clandestine weapons programs. You could use a uh, regular reactor. Regular reactors make it too all the time. You could then harvest that. Uh, yeah. Then the idea is that eventually this could, someone could, for example, either transport it to a point of entry, bring it to a densely populated area and detonate it. The other problem, of course, is that we have just huge you know, stockpiles, as I talked about. Some of this can be stolen, smuggled to the United States or some, some other country that's not a not rule and detonate it. And then there's, of course, the possibility of a nuclear war itself. Like I talked, until now, I've been talking about this scenario. Really. So what can we do? There's lots of these problems are policy oriented. So lots of this have to do with policy, like the example is nuclear. But there's a significant technological component to this. So lots of things we can do. We can develop, we can do policy research, okay? You can use various kind of techniques for try to understand from open source information that the country is up to up to some something. There's nuclear forensics. There is something I'll talk about uh, if we have time about zero knowledge detectors. This is a way of authenticating an object without finding anything about that object. Okay. Which is something you need to do with nuclear weapons if you want to um, dismantle them. And then also some of the field called cargo security that I work in, where you are essentially trying to develop technology for scanning rapidly containers, maritime containers, for the presence of nuclear weapons and peace alters. There was a significant fear that in Al Qaeda, ISIS could get hold of some nuclear weapons, smuggle them, and detonate them. And how do you, how do how do you catch something like this in a flow of It's a very difficult problem. Um, there's a nuclear forensics. Um, so the one problem that I, I, I work in has to do with specifically with the uh, nuclear arms reduction treaties and the ways in which these arms reduction treaties are being uh, verified, which are essentially not really being uh, verified. I'm going to skip a little bit and focus this. This is our group, this is myself, some colleagues, our students at MIT. But uh, so there have been a couple of treaties that have been signed in the past, which really, remember I said that numbers have come down. So the question is, how do people verify that the other side is actually you know, doing what they said they would be doing under the treaty? How do they verify specifically that they are dismantling those nuclear wars? The short answer is they actually do not. Nobody actually verifies that the nuclear warheads are being dismantled. What they do verify is that the delivery systems are being uh, dismantled. Remember, I, I said that the, the, one of the bottlenecks, one of the critical components for waging nuclear war is a delivery system that's on. And the fact that the number of the delivery systems is a fairly good proxy for your strike capability. If you have got 1,000 missiles and 10,000 warheads, the other 9,000 warheads are useless because you cannot launch them. 
So it's not such a bad idea to target the uh, delivery vehicles. Delivery vehicles means intercontinental ballistic missiles, means bombers, means submarine launched stuff, all those things, you know, uh, cruise missiles. Okay. So here's a couple of examples of how this was being done. This is Americans and the Soviets uh, you know, banned intermediate uh, range, intermediate, intermediate range nuclear forces, which threw out a whole kind of class of delivery systems. Like remember that eight minute I was talking about? The idea was to get rid of that. So how did they verify that? Well, they just come and visually look at this. This is a KGB operative looking at a Griffon missile. This is a member of Congress looking at a Soviet ICBM before it's going to get chopped up and stuff like that. And in a more dramatic example, in the Americans and the Russians now signed the START Treaty in 1993, where the Americans agreed to uh, destroy 356 of their B-52 strategic bombers. And how did they do this? They drag them out into the desert, they guillotine them, this special thing that is pulled down, chopped them in pieces. They let them sit and dry in the desert, and then the Russian satellites flew overhead, took pictures, they are like, yep, counted them in, and said, yep, okay, so they're, they're destroyed. Okay. So, so we they just made them out of cardboard. So right, like so that's, that's a good thing. So, so, so the thing is that people do ask this question, but I mean, yes. what if someone like puts it out of cardboard, right? The whole point is that yes, you could do it, and yes, that's possible. So, uh, so, but what, how about the new, but this leaves out nuclear warheads out of this formula. In fact, we have this huge reserve of nuclear warheads that both sides don't want to dismantle because there's no pressure. The other side is not dismantled, the rest we're not going to dismantle. So can we, can we come up with technologies that will, you know, authenticate <coughs> nuclear warheads before dismantling them? Uh, so, so we should allow future treaties to go not after delivery vehicles, but after the warheads themselves. Okay. That's something that has never been done. Now, you could do this with an airplane, with something like this, it's sort of hard to achieve. But here's what a reentry vehicle looks like. I should be using this term, reentry vehicle. So essentially these cones that are about this big, which have the thermonuclear bomb inside over here somewhere. And essentially it's a cone, you cannot look inside. You don't know, does it have a nuclear bomb inside or does it have, is it empty? How do you authenticate something like this? Do you look inside? Well, they will never let you because they will find out classified information. So how do you authenticate something while learning nothing classified about it. Can okay. you check for radiation here? Geiger counter. Yeah, but the, uh, everything is radioactive. You can throw in a piece of radioactive material, say, there is a bomb. But wait, you destroy yeah. like randomly. Yeah. Right. yeah. Huh? You pick randomly that wants to be destroyed. <laughs> but then most of them are in, in, you know, you show up in a, some in room and there's this thing are sitting, but they tell you, yes, it's a bomb, believe me, and we're going to destroy it. So how do you authenticate it? And that's that, that's that's the problem. Why, why is this information still sensitive if both countries know how to build nuclear weapons? Because if you, there's a couple of reasons. Um, there's some of this is in my opinion for somewhat irrational reasons, uh, but some of these are for rational reasons. One of them is that if you know what are the opponents' uh, design, you could in principle that that would help you come up with possibly um, counter measures and this. You could, for example, there's this thing called pit melt, you can cause detonations which will melt the pit and stuff like that. But in general, the countries, it, it's, you know, you could argue whether it's useful or not. Many scientists that I've worked with, they think that classification system is stupid. But the fact on the ground is that the countries do not allow you to find out anything about their, uh, their, their weapons information. Another reason why it's, it, it is actually can be a problem is that if you have a, a trilateral verification regime, where it's not Russians and Americans, but let's say from Norway, and do we want Norway to find it to get nuclear weapon information? Do we want some other countries nuclear weapon information? Short answer is no. Not Norway. So. That's socialized medicine. How can they be that, right? So I'm going to skip a little bit and talk about how do you approach this problem. So the general notion is that you start off, instead of doing an absolute verification, Yes, this object is a nuclear weapon, and no, this object is not a nuclear weapon. You ask yourself, can I do a comparison? And anyone from physics will tell you that comparisons are always way easier to do than absolute measurements. Differential measurements in general are always easier for me to do. Comparing, proving that this object has as much, this cup has as much water as this cup, is easier than actually looking inside the cup and uh, things like that. So the way you approach this problem is you get hold of a golden cup, you get what is called a template. A particular design. So there's design W88, and then you go and you get this candidate for it. So you know this one is real. And the way you do it is that you take it randomly from an ICBM, uh, from top of an ICBM. You know that the thing is real. Now I can do comparisons. Okay. So then you go to the actual 
you know, warhead sitting in a basement or in a, some kind of a hangar or something like that. And now you ask yourself, is this one identical to this one? Is this one identical to this one? Is this one identical to this one? If they are identical via some metric, which is a whole another can of worms, then, if, then you can conclude that if this is authentic, then this one must be authentic as well. And then you send them to dismantlement, you count these numbers towards that country publications under the treaty, everything is great. But there's a couple of problems. You have to do this while finding out nothing about the interior of this box. <coughs> and the second thing is that you need to be hoaxed. You can make sure that if someone's trying to hoax you, you catch the hoax. And if someone's being honest, you don't waste a lot. Okay. So how do, you, how do you do this? Yes. This one, you, what you do is that you, there's many different ways that people are proposed. One way is that you have an inspection party, which makes an unannounced surprise visit to an ICBM site. And then goes and opens up an ICBM, <coughs> gets an auto offered up, pulls out one of the warheads from an ICBM, and in order for that country to have a nuclear deterrent, they need to have real warheads on their ICBM. If they were to put fake ICBM just to cheat you, they would be losing their deterrent. So but you're not going to know. Huh? Wait, wait, that doesn't work because you don't know that they could put fake ones, so they have a deterrent. Well, what if you, what if you find out? What if, <laughs> well, your, uh, what if, your, what if, what if your intelligence finds out? The whole point is that, is there a way to cheat this? Maybe, but the cost is so large. Because if, if they are caught somehow, if someone through intelligence, through satellite imagery, because like if they do that, it's not, it's not like you go and you put in a credit card and you put the other one in your pocket. No, you have to open this thing up, you have to bring it, put in these things. You, they're gonna be able to see it through satellites. They're gonna see it through other ways. You can see there's lots of strange activity at the site. So it, it's not so easy. And the costs associated with it are so large that if they are caught, suddenly they are, they are completely invulnerable to a nuclear strike. They're not going to do something like that. Fine. All right. Um, and uh, what about missile design? Is it sensitive? Missile design is quite sensitive. Yeah. Uh, so how do we deal with the missile design in this approach? So what they have done in the past is that they have taken these things and they have rolled them out. Nobody looks inside this thing. But the thing with the missiles, at least they still think that it's difficult to take a missile. Because missiles are large, if someone tries to move them around, it's easily you know, detectable, we have no technical means, and things like that. Then you blow them up in the field. I remember in the late 80s, they were showing on TV in the Soviet Union, like how they were detonating the ICBM, and they were almost kind of celebrating. So if you have like thousands so, of nuclear weapons, yeah. then it's fine for you to make 90 or 80% of them fake. Uh, because you still have twenty percent that you know, you know yeah. which ones they are that you can yeah, actually yeah, yeah. launch. Yeah, that's right. so, so, but, so, you, but the inspector would actually. So what you do is the following, right? So maybe they have done this with half of their warheads, and yeah. they are sort of counting like that half is enough to deter a strike. Or so what you do is that you go and you said choosing one, you do this at four different sites, okay. and then you compare them against each other. And the probability that all four of them happen to be from that eighty percent or something like that is pretty small. Yeah. Again, it's a, at some level, it's a probability thing. So you basically need to, to show that these four that you pick do not vary, because if they vary, yes, then... exactly. Okay. They're they definitely somehow identical. Okay. Okay, so, so, so how, we, how do we do this? So what you need to do, the question this comparison itself, right, is a difficult question. How do you, how do you define two things being identical? At, and at the strictest level, uh, identical means same isotopics and same geometry, right? If you can come up with treaties that will specifically go after the warheads themselves, there's a real benefit in that. But in order for those treaties to happen, you have to verify them. <laughs> Otherwise, if they are not verifiable, the two sides will just not sign. And to verify it, you have to be able to do verification while maintaining secrecy. Okay? That's just ground truth. So how do you do this problem? Like I showed this simple image and said that you do this comparison. So there's a concept in information theory that some people may have heard about. It's called zero knowledge, the zero knowledge proof. Where essentially you show that, you know, A is equal to B, but you don't find out what the value of A is, or B is, right? So think about it like you have two cups of water, there is, you want to prove someone that the it's amount of water in two of them is the same. So instead of putting them on measuring the weights, you can put them on scale and show that they're the same. Or another example for zero knowledge that uh, my colleague likes to use is, let's say you're walking in the forest, and your friend tells you, hey, I have this magic way of finding out how many pine needles there are on this tree. But I am not going to tell you. Just believe me. And you think about how can I verify that he or she can do this without actually having him to give up the secrets. So you do this test. You say, okay, 
count how many time rules there are on the street. Then you come and you grab, after, after he has done the counting, you go grab a bunch of needles and say, okay, tell me how much there are now. And tell me what the difference is. Okay. So, so, so don't tell me actually, sorry, don't tell me how many needles there are. Just tell me how, what's the difference before I grab it. And then let's say he says eight, because I know how to do it. You open your hand, you count, there's eight. In the process, you verify that yes, he knows how to count needles, but at the point, he, but he found, didn't find out how it was done. If you think that he maybe got lucky, you repeat this experiment again, and then the probability keeps going the way that. So how can we use this for verifying the nuclear warheads? The idea, the general idea is that we want to have something that is sensitive both to the geometry of a particular object as well as to its isotopy. Okay. So what's a good way, what signal is it? So we need kind of some kind of a signal, some kind of process which is very isotope dependent. And it turns out that in, in, in physics there's a thing called resonance. Okay. But basically we have some quantum system, for example, like an um, atom. Okay, like fluorescence, like like neon, neon, an atom of neon. Okay, which is a quantum state with discrete. Unfortunately, we cannot see here with discrete energy levels. And if you hit it with the with the electron or photon of correct energy, you get it, kick it up to an excited state, and then it excites, it emits a photon. Okay. And if you look at the photon, and look at its energy, its color, whatever, you from there you can infer which element it is. Turns out that there is also the nuclear equivalent of atomic fluorescence. Okay. There's nuclear fluorescence, there is nuclear resonances. If you have this nuclei, they're all quantum systems. So they have all these discrete states. So if you excite them with, with, with some particle, they'll emit, they'll either absorb only particles of a particular energy, or they will emit particles of a specific energy, which, which are unique to a particular isotope. So essentially we have this technique which is exploiting this process I'm going to sort of skip things, but basically in atomic fluorescence, if you take this your neon light, you heat it up, you look at this through a prism, you'll see this emission spectrum, and then if you take like a continuous spectrum and shoot it through cold gas, you'll see what's called an absorption spectrum. An emission spectrum is how we know what the, the surface of the, uh, the sun is, 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 is made out of. We can see all the lights, from there we can infer all the gases that are in there, all the elements that are in there. And the absorption spectrum, we use that for determining what interstellar medium is made out of. We look at a faraway star, we see which lines are missing, which means that between us and that star, there is some gas which corresponds to photons. And the nuclear equivalent is very similar, except that if this is on an electron volt scale, this stuff is, you know, the, the, the resonances with nuclei are typically on a mega electron volt scale or things like that. How is this zero knowledge if you, you get yes. to it? Well, I'm getting there. So if you were to take some kind of an object and but trigger this process, to be uniform, what's that? The uh, material does it have to be uniform. Or so, so the material itself is non-uniform. So this, remember, I showed but that hollow, hollow spheres, huh? Be, be... No problem. Right? Right? So, so you've got this hollow sphere that I showed but earlier. Remember? It's, a, it's kind of it does look exactly like right. It's just an example. So I'm getting that. Okay. So. So the way we do this thing is that, so we've got this thing, which I, so there's this thing I talked about earlier, you know, this is uranium or plutonium helosphere. They're called pits for a variety of reasons, like a pit of a fruit or something like that. So how do you, if you have got some kind of an object like this, and if you shoot neutrons through it, and specifically on the epithermal scale, epithermal is like on a very low energy uh, scale, there's this really cool resonances. Okay, just like with atomic fluorescence, you have got this resonant phenomena which selectively absorbs neutrons at a specific energy. So if you measure the neutrons after they've gone through this object, okay, from the places, the energies where the absorption has happened, you can infer what it's made out of. Now, if you were to do this directly with the pit itself, you could you will find out what element it's made out of, its geometry, you will find out everything about it. It will not be allowed. So you have to zero knowledge it out. And the way we do this is the following. So I'm going to skip this thing. You have got this golden copy. So, for example, the Russian, you got American inspector showing up to the Russian side. You get this golden copy. You get this one template. It's also called templates. Basically, one that you know is true. Okay. And this object over here is in an opaque box. Okay. You cannot see it. Okay. What the Russians do is that they allow you to do a radiography, you allow you to do this transmission not directly through this object over here, but using something that is called the reciprocal, such that every line that goes through, it sees equal amount of uh, material. 
So over here, where you are the thickest, the reciprocal is thinnest. Here, where the hollow sphere is thinnest, the reciprocal is thickest, such that at the end, you get a flat image. Okay? A flat image is by default essentially information less, has no information in it. Okay? But furthermore, uh, what you can, but, but what you can do is the following. You do this measurement with a, a golden copy of the reciprocal, okay, that the Russians have provided. Russians bring, you, you have identified this, they have brought this in. You do measurement, you get a spectrum, okay, and you get an image. And the image is flat, tells you nothing about geometry. And here's what you do. You switch to the next one, which we call the candidate, where you don't know, is this real or not? And you do the same measurement. For both of them, you get a spectrum, and you get an image. And what you do is that you do a comparison. You say, do this spectra match? Do the images match? If the spectra match, but if the images match, and if this reciprocal was kept in place, it means that these objects have to be the same as well. Okay? In the process, you found out nothing about this object because what you got was a flat image. Flat image tells you nothing. So an equivalent to this, so this is what's called physical cryptography. <coughs> the encryption happens not in the computational Sorry, region, So the Russians but supply the fit. Russians supply the reciprocal. Yes. Who supplies the candidate? Uh, they, they, they supply. No, the, 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 sorry, the, the pit, the golden copy, you supply it together. The inspectors identify, they bring it from the warhead itself. The Russians bring in the candidate that they want to prove are honest. And then you do this comparison between what you know is a real uh, object and the candidate object. But they're not allowed to change the reciprocal. They're not allowed. The reciprocal has to be always there. You visually see it over there. So, like a computational equivalent of this is who uses MD5 sums, checksums, for verifying that an object, like you know, you download an image for an operating system. How do you know someone didn't inject some something with you know all kinds of root kits and stuff like that? They you see the you know on uh, you know on the website you see the MD5 sum, and then you run the MD5 sum on your computer, you compare the hashes. So it's the same concept. If you have got two files and the MD5 sum gives the same hash. It means that the files must be the same as well. And yet you find out nothing about the file from the, from the, from the hash itself. So basically, this is the file, this is the checksum, and what you get at the end is the hash. Except, except they don't get the key to the checksum, right? They don't get the check at all. The, the inspectors, they do. They get the image. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Checksum, not the hash. Yes, yes, they cannot see the reciprocal. You're absolutely right. This is less information than the checksum. Imagine that the checksum can rule something out. And, uh, so it's a checksum. It's, it's different from the checksum in the sense that checksum you have, you know, you have avalanche systems, and things yeah. like that. In this case, it's a fairly linear system, so you don't have avalanche. Why is it called cryptography? Cryptography because well, because you essentially you end up getting information from which you cannot reconstruct the original information. But it's an information which is nevertheless useful in that it allows you to track things. So to, do, to, do different, to do comparisons. It okay. sounds like everyone has to study the golden copy and then uh, learn how that is made. No, the golden copy is also, you, you, don't, you don't get to eyeball the golden copy, it's an opaque box. Mm -hmm. Right? No, the golden copy is just something that you randomly pick from four sites and then you yeah. have to do the golden copy. How do you know what? How do you know that the golden copy is real? So you, because you could pick it up from the top of an ICDM. You went to an ICBM site, like we discussed earlier. Yeah. You pick a random, you show up at a random ICBM site, you pick a random warhead from that. And because the country, in order to have nuclear deterrence, it used to have real warheads on their ICBM, you are pretty confident that, those models, that at least that one must be real. Yeah. Or you pick like four, mm -hmm. as you said. Or you pick because like four and you compare them with each other. So you mentioned that in China, yeah. the warheads in the yeah. ICBMs are. This, this would work with that. You, you need to have what is called. You need to have what's called a situational context. You need to have something where the, you could trace the authenticity of an object to a particular situation. In, in, in China, where things are moving around, and maybe there's a way to do this. I haven't thought about it. You, you must have mentioned this before, but I missed. Why is, it, why is it not allowed to know what's inside the pit? Why do we, need, why do we have this problem? Because if you find out what the pit is, so what the pit is made out of, you can find out some things about their manufacturing processes. For example, if you know the enrichment of the pit, you can find out what is the, it's a whole topic, there's a, the plutonium weapons, they have this fizzle probability, they might not work. And it's that might not work is embedded not in crappy work, but it's embedded in the physics of the process. So if the enrichment is wrong or it's off, 
their weapons will not be as effective. And if the Americans find out that their weapons will work only, say, 70% of the time, as opposed to 99% of the time, that will change the balance of the calculus of deterrence and stuff like that. And uh, in general, both sides are extremely... Um, unfortunately, the way this works is most of this uh, classification regime is defined by the bureaucrats who don't understand physics. <laughs> don't understand that. Just assume the war. Most of the time, the, the, lots of at least what I've seen working in Los Alamos is lots of the logic assumes the war. So let's just keep the secret. Yeah. Americans actually, you know, despite all this uh, all the craziness, the Americans are at least quite comparatively like reasonable. Like we have, I was working in Los Alamos. Was one building half the building was doing classified work, the other half there were Chinese, Russians, mm -hmm. and Americans working on open, like, you know, <coughs> on, on, on regular physics. Like in Russia, it'd be out of question. For someone to go to Sara for Arzama 16, like being a Russian citizen, you would need a pass. Yeah. Like for foreigners, like, you know, you need a very special pass to go to there. So Americans are relatively open when it comes to this, to, to this thing. You're saying that the fact that the war is about what to research is basically false. It's false. I mean, it's, there, is some, there is some technological merit to it. It's just, I, I believe that the technological merit is overstated. There's a big policy political component. <laughs> What you are saying is that Americans are more willing to accept NASA to work with their nuclear, you know, facilities. Historically, historically, yes. There was, there was, a, there was a time in the nineties when there was lab to lab collaboration between Americans and Russians, where Americans would go to Russia, they would visit Arzamas, they would visit Sarah. It was like time of brotherhood and. Rudenschaft and, and things like that. And that time is passed. <laughs> that time is gone. Until 2000. <laughs> in 2005, there was, uh, until 2005, there was quite a, bit of, uh, quite a bit of very good collaboration. Lots of good things were done. Then and now, and now. Are there any reasons for that, actually? What's that? There were reasons on both sides. Huh? Is there even a reason why Russian started to do different things? There, there were both the Russians became more sustainable. Well, it, it's no, a whole no, topic. Because of anti, uh, that, uh, anti uh, there, there was NATO expansion, there was anti ballistic missile mm -hmm. defense, there was this uh, super fuse that Americans are developing to make their warheads more lethal. The Russians in general became more reactive. Americans, when they were doing this collaboration, apparently they really snuck up on Russians and found out some things that they were not supposed to find out. You know, anyway, it's, it's a whole story. But to, to complete this, this, this talk, so we did some simulations where we, what we did was that we, for this scenario, we compared um, golden coffee with a candidate which where the isotopics was very different. And essentially, if you look at the transmitted spectra, you can see very clear differences. There's a very there's a dramatic difference between the two things. But also, if you look at the images, this is what a real image would look like for a real pit. This is what a hoax pit would immediately look like. So you clearly can tell from the images that they are different as well. And as a very last thing, there's, I also discussed the fact that it's, it's truly zero knowledge in the sense that because the combination of Peter reciprocal essentially is a flat thing, you basically, it's not exactly flat, but you can show that if you take the pit of the reciprocal and replace it with a flat plate, a geometry less structural flat plate, you will end up getting the same distribution. Which means that this spectrum, here, this distribution over here, contains no geometric information. If the transmitted signal does not allow you to tell the difference between pit and reciprocal and the plate, it tells you that basically now we're saying that you cannot reconstruct the geometry at all without knowing the reciprocal. You, so you kept talking to us about a, a sphere. Yeah. So now there is some kind of important geometry. What are we talking about? Well, you don't want, you want to show that, well, what if this, from this image, you could maybe infer something about what a pit, what a pit is made out of. How do you prove, sure how, how do you prove that, yeah, how do you prove that, that you will never be able to infer what a pit is, what the shape of a pit is? The way we do this is that we're saying, <coughs> this is a pit, this is a reciprocal. If you do the same measurement on a flat object, which has no geometry, you would get the same image. It says that the image tells you nothing about the geometry. No, I get it, but, but what could be the geometry? The geometry is the radius of the thing. What's the inner radius of the field? What's the outer of the radius? Of the what if it's not a sphere? What is an elliptical object? So this plate is like completely random size? No, it, uh, the plate, the thickness was chosen to be essentially the sum of this and this over here. The plate was essentially chosen to be about this thick. Uh -huh. So this assumed yeah. that the reciprocal is somehow inert, right? Uh, 
factor tries to create a reciprocal that can reconfigure itself somehow? Uh, sure. I mean, if you, yeah, I mean, you could think, you would imagine the reciprocal which somehow changes its shape. Yeah. But that's that's really difficult. Yeah. It would be very difficult to. You have got the reciprocal which is in the little box. There's no power coming to it. You know. Uh, you, you, know. Have a mm -hmm. huh? you can. What you can do is, um, yeah. But I mean, it it it'd be very difficult to do it in a way that is something that in a small box, and you know, given that it's a constrained thing, it's a soft metal. So it's, I don't think it's a very realistic thing to do. It's also a matter of geometrical alignment of yes. those two. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and those sensor rushes, they don't uh, give it to you to do. So, so yes, they have to do the alignment. They have to do the alignment, absolutely. Because if you don't align, you don't get the flat image. You start getting edges. Right. So you cannot allow that. Right. Uh, so because you detect spectrum in a range of energies, so reciprocal should be made of the same materials. So, so it yeah. will also be made of plutonium, yes. and it will be radioactive, and you should probably handle it properly, and you have problems with uh, its own uh, key and possibility that of reciprocal being uh, supercritical. Yeah. It's also a problem. Yeah. So we did a calculation for specifically for determining the k-effective for this combination, and we found out that the k-effective, like just to answer your question, is 0 0.86. And it can be brought down to 0 0.6 by taking it... Slice. Like slicing it, extending it, and telescoping it, there's many different things. Um, but let's see, I, there was something else I wanted to, uh, to, to uh, answer. Um, what, what did you say in the very beginning? Uh, energy spectrum. Ah, yes. So the energy spectrum, actually, if you were to look at this energy spectrum, you could, in principle, infer the combined enrichment. Right? So if you were to make the pit from the same material as the, as the I'm sorry, to make this like receptor the same as pit, it would increasingly infer the inversion of that, which you don't want to do. But what you can do is that you can add additional amount of material of a different enrichment, and then what you end up getting is you end up having a measure of combined enrichment, which does not allow you to tell what enrichment of the pit is. It only allows you to give like bounds, you know, which can be made very broad. Uh, one, one more question. Uh -huh. uh, what if you use some, uh, a relatively exotic material, let's say, is required in design of your uh, mix uh, of your uh, bomb, and you don't want to give away this information. What do you ah. do with this? Um, let's say they have some amount of iridium, and they don't want to tell that they use iridium for some reason. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible? And so, the question is, can they do put something in the reciprocal which somehow? Cancels out your video or something like that. So actually, I don't, I don't remember. I don't think your region has any resonances such as radio, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's say they have some feature of design which they don't want to give away that they have this material, which is not right. so, so, I'll, I'll put it this way: if you, um, as long as long as you put the same material over here, I think you can make it such that it's impossible to infer. So, for example, there is some material X which has, let's say, it has resonances in this region, mm -hmm. which is that you put the same material over here, just like you did it with plutonium, okay? And I think and then you add an extension. I think I'm not 100 percent sure. I have to think about this. I think you can do it so that it's but still. Then you will you will have flat spectrum, but you will still uh, in your resolution of your Spectrum as energy, you will have peaks, that right. will be characteristic peaks for these. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that, there is some possibility like that. There is some possibility like that. Um, something tells me it's probably possible to, to, to change that. With the most resonances, so it has to be in the right energy window. Which yeah, is so yeah. Different. So, real question is that if this is some material which is there, which also has resonances in this energy window, that's the question. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so, we can go and look it up. So, I have a basic question about this graph. Like, when you first showed it, I, I thought that these things look the same. You know, there's a basically a magnitude effect, but other than that, it's, it's surprising to me that the shape is that's, that's what the That's what the reviewer for of the paper said. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> right, so basically, like, what exactly do you mean? <laughs> so, so, the shapes are different, but also the magnitude is also important. Okay. Because you do measurement for a fixed amount of time for a specific, you know, measurement time and stuff like that, right? So you know how many neutrons went in. So if the magnetism is off, that itself is a useful observation. 
So you have to very tightly control the time. Of yes, of course. Yeah, so of that's right. So the sort. That's right. Yeah. So could you could have, for example, some Kelly, the epithermal neutrons could come from a fixed source, an isotope, uh, no, uh, isotro, uh, isotopic source. So it's crucial. It has to be a source that you control. Uh, that you at least control the amount of, basically, the amount of neutrons that came in, which yeah. I think is doable. Yeah. In which case, you can exploit the magnitudes. Yeah. You know, can, can you guarantee that you're not going to vary the source? Because I, I can also imagine that if you do this at a different okay. energy state, you, you get. So you could have the inspectors bring their own source. Right? You can bring their own source so to make okay, sure that's, that. That's what I'm saying. Is, is, is that, let's say the source varies the intensity, so the reciprocal. Presumably works for some very specific energy states. That's right. Uh -huh. Because if you're varying the state, you might be able That's to right. get a non-flat image at a different energy from, state. from the source. Yeah. So you need to have a source which is stable. Absolutely. But that's doable. That's 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 yeah, right. to calibrate the kettle then. So it has to be something. So it, the, the so question is how do you get neutrons like this? There's a few different ways. The simplest way of doing it is using well, simplest way of doing it is you could use uh, like a any kind of a neutron emitter, like californium, and then you can put some water or plastic next to it, you know, bring the energies towards this regime. And then it's essentially, it's, an, it's, a, sta it's a DC source. It's, it, does not, it does not change its intensity. What do they call it? You can, you, can, you, can, you can also use like an accelerator to do this thing. You can use proton accelerators on lithium-7, which gives you epithermal neutrons also. And, but the whole point is that the inspectors can bring their own source. Which they have make sure make sure it is right. stable. Yeah, right. but that's what, what I'm saying is that if, if the inspectors create a source that sort of allows them to get more information. Than ah, no, no, it, it won't. It won't because of what they will do is that if the source is changing, right? So you are saying if if it's a yeah. source which is changing its energy or yeah, something yeah, like yeah. that. Ah, uh, oh, I see. That's what you were saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how would you get something that has an energy? I can't think of. I, there are ways to make sources that produce neutrons of very specific energies. Those are quite complex sources. They're like very large. There's a thing called velocity selectors. So what you can do is that the inspectors can bring their source, the host can verify, check the source, say, yep, there's no weird stuff going on. It's a very simple flat source. We verified it. You can use it. You know, um, the kind of sources that where you could really do this kind of things, they're, they're called velocity selectors, neutron velocity selectors. They're large, they involve moving parts at extremely high rates, and it's, it will get caught very soon. It, it's, it's not easy to do something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Valera asked a question. Yes, uh, Valera, please ask. Valera, please ask a question. Yeah. Valera, 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 Okay, we'll, we'll get to another one. Uh, so we, we know that uh, Russia and the US have like tens of thousands of warheads. Uh -huh. uh, how many different types there are of them? Because for each of them, reciprocal is a different. And what um, is nature of variation within yeah, them? Yeah, so for every weapon type, for every geometry type, you need to have your, its own reciprocal. That's right. But in every class of weapons, there is something like hundreds of weapons. It's not like every weapon is, is very different or something like that. It's not like you have to do the reciprocal for, F, for every weapon. You, you know, like the W, at least on the American side, W88, there's a few hundred. And they're all identical. Exact, what's that? Are they so all that's, so, okay, so that's a good question that there's manufacturing powers, which we don't know. Right? It's a golden copy and the template have, not because they're trying to cheat you, but just, they are just built slightly differently because you know, they didn't do it very well. Especially in Russia. Huh? Especially in Russia. So my intuition says me that they should ought to be able to do the thing down to fractions of a millimeter. Yeah. For a variety of reasons, the surfaces have to be very well polished because there's this rain kill and stability that you get, that, et cetera, et cetera. I think they do them extremely precisely at a precision rate where you can you can make your resolution coarse enough where you are not, you know, where you won't be uh, sensitive to different. Whatever, question. Now I know your name really well. Yeah, I've heard it from 10 people. Is this some sort of a, a scientific project for the right Yes, yes, it's a scientific project. What, what, what's the idea behind this? You want to propose this approach to government, to yes. US government? Yes. 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 Are, you, are you sure that other governments, like Russian governments, will support this? That's a very good question, and I'm going to Russia next year for exactly that reason. 
Um, so I can, see, I can see no chance. What's that? No way. So today, why? so here's the thing, right? Why, why no way? If, so, so we have gone through this. Okay. So in the 90s and 2000s, there was lots of collaboration about exactly this kind of projects. And most of them did not succeed because they were using a very different approach, which I was going to talk about at the dinner. Um, in order for any of these things, we can come up with the bestest technology which does everything. But if there is no political will, Absolutely. nothing will work. Right? So today, the political will yeah, is it's negative. It's, it's not zero, it's negative. negative. Believe, believe that, huh? um, as I understood the situation, uh, nuclear weapons. Yeah. It's not technology formula. Okay. Technology is only 20%. 80% is Polish. Well, of course, and, absolutely. Uh, we are not touching Polish here, but right. uh, since present time, politics mm -hmm. takes everything. So, so let me finish my what I was saying. Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's not interrupt each other. <laughs> so what I was saying is the following, that if today I were try to go sell this to, to, to them, right? <laughs> Nobody would take this. Okay, because they don't even talk to each other, let alone agree to reduction, etc. But the purpose of academic research is not to solve problems that are ready today. The idea is to solve problems that will be out 10 years from now. What we want to do is the following, that 10 years from now, when things become, finally people become mature and start talking to each other, and they're like, okay, fine, let's do this thing. Is there a technology? No, because nobody thought about this because everyone was upset with each other. We want to have a technology that at that point will be ready for adoption. That's exactly the role of academia. Nation labs are more thinking more like in a year ahead or something like that. But the purpose of academia is so it's possible that this will never be adopted. Okay, and that's up, okay. If that's okay. Just for a second, and that you know, the last time that I'm interrupting, I think you two have two very different approaches because you are doing academic things, you're doing academic study mm -hmm. that probably will work in 10, 20 years, 30, 40 years hopefully, from now, hopefully. then people will go ahead for it. And yeah, you work, no yeah, and you work in industry, you need stuff, but like academic, you know, 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 so that's not... <laughs> So, so I work for six years in industry. So I'm at, I worked for two years in, in, in national lab. So I know the three worlds. It's, I have no illusions about. So, so next year actually we're going to Russia. Precisely to we're going to meet in Moscow. And the hope is to because the national labs in Russia don't want to talk to us. But uh, the academic uh, academicians in Russia actually are interested in some kind of contact. The hope is to have some kind of communication so that when the relations improve, we can extend this to the laboratories. What's the uh, you know. Uh, the uh, differences uh, in which sense are very different what organizations. What do you mean with national labs that are not part of academia? No, as absolutely not. Those are la big laboratories that do scientific research, develop nuclear weapons, like do applied Mars. research and things like that. They don't teach. Uh -huh. They don't do, you know, their research is quite a bit geared towards more short-term type of uh, problems that are dictated by the government. So they are not the part of academia science? Um, no, they're not part. Of, well, I'm not. No, they're not part of academy. So, the concept of academy, academy sciences in, in Soviet Union, academy sciences also included scientists who were working in the laboratories. But when I say academia, I specifically mean universities. So, so what, what, what are the existing uh, uh, before this project? What is currently being done? Let's say in Iran, we are verifying whether they have nuclear weapons. So, uh, you know, in Korea yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. What is the current? So, so the, the, the way the verification. So, the, it, so what I'm describing here is really makes sense between countries like the United States and Russia. Yeah. For even for China, right? I was asked a question earlier, right? Um, it's the situation is quite a bit different. But you probably need different type of solution. But remember, 95% of the weapons are in the hands of Russians and Americans. But, for yeah. Iran, for Iran. Oh, yeah. And the problems are quite a bit different. So the way it's typically done is that there's inspectors who are there constantly. There's cameras who are have installed, are making sure that the Iranians are not reconfiguring their centrifuges. They, they make sure that the Iranians are not building more centrifuges. They make sure that the Iranians have not modifying any of the things that they are not allowed to okay, modify. Okay, but they're not actually verifying whether the weapon which exists. Is they don't have weapons. The Iranians don't have weapons. Okay. okay. Yeah. They have taken out some amount of. Uh, there's other problems with Iran. There's other kind of. For example, we want to show that if Iran say we have only 600 kilograms of LEU, uh -huh. how do we show that it was 600? I'm sorry, 6,000. 6, right? Uh -huh. How do we make sure that it's 6,000, not 60,000? Uh -huh. They don't have another 54,000 stashed away. How do you verify that? Uh -huh. So that's also an interesting question. Some people are working on those problems as well. There, there's a field called nuclear archaeology, okay. where you are trying to infer from secondary effects how much. Of these materials have been produced. Okay, but this particular thing is exactly the situation where two countries are trying to mutually reduce their arsenal. Yes. Okay. 
Question? Why is action? She has been waiting for a long time, so I'm going to insist on her asking. No. Um, no. So, my question was actually. Um, Answers already, but I got a new one. Is this a is this a working approach right now? Is this what is, is this what it is? Uh, how the uh, inspection works right now? Or so so right now the, the the so in terms of what has been done or what is being done, it's what I, the pictures that I showed earlier, where nobody has actually verified any of what it. This is none none of them has ever done. So so none of this was done. Right? That's right. Yeah. And so the hope is that when they when they if and when they agree to actually verifiably dismantle nuclear warheads themselves and not delivery systems like they have done in the past, like the short pictures, right? Yeah. The hope is that they will, they, will, they will need some way of doing some kind of a verification, authentication. And the hope is that they'll use some technique like this. We were also working on another technique, which I don't have time to talk about, but, but yeah, there are many different people who are trying to come up with different techniques. The key thing is to do something which can, is both very sensitive, but at the same time can achieve the zero knowledge aspect of it. Is Israel playing, you know, with Israel has this policy of silence about this nuclear arsenal, right? It does not admit or deny the existence of this arsenal. Does it participate in any of these treaties? Um, I don't know of any of these treaties or anything. Most, 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 of, most of this verification. We do know they have, they have nuclear power. What's that? No, no one knows for sure. Not power. No, no, no. Power. no, 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 no. They don't admit that they have they don't admit, but yes, yes, everyone no, no, knows everyone that they have near in the south, near yeah, the north. But one. no one ever told that indeed there is a like, nuclear bomb there. They don't admit that they have like real so bomb. No, no, no. There is. There is it, it's an open secret. Everyone knows that Israel has nuclear weapons. Yeah, there's a there's a Mordechai Vanunu who showed pictures with actual plutonium pits in glove yeah, boxes. It's, 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 it's an open. Is open there a term for that, like deliberate ambiguity or something? There's something, yeah, yeah. It's an example of the deliberate ambiguity. Because essentially, the idea is that they don't want to admit it because it creates all kinds of legal international problems. On the other hand, they want everyone to know that they have weapons because that's the purpose of having weapons in general, right? A significant cost on their economy to develop. But that's actually a great point because um, I'm not sure the lecture spent from my scientific or political whatever. But you, it's interesting that this project is straightforward, so simple that it must work. It will work, right? Right? Well, it's, and, and I don't know why. Tell it to the nature reviewers who are doing it right now that I'm fighting with the them. The logic <laughs> is easy and you can right. introduce the amount of variables to like make a mess out of it, right? Right. Yeah. The trickery is what you said earlier, yeah. because it's not. It's about like who's it bigger, basically. So it's not in their interest. It's in your interest to measure it scientifically and right, right. have accurate information and facts. They don't give a shit right. about that, right? That's right. When you say so, they, what who do you mean? No, we in Russia or here, but right. you know, the, the first part of the lecture, mm -hmm. the premise was let's combine the technology for science and uh -huh. um, powers that be to sure. make nicer policies and smarter world. That's right. Uh -huh. This goes contrary to the premise of like let's cover it up and like pretend like we are having more uh -huh. power. Uh -huh. So, identification of facts actually is awesome and it will work. Yeah. So, 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 but I mean, it goes against the political agenda, actually. The political agenda says that or, or, political agenda is I'm not, not sure if I'm it right. The political or, agenda is not disinterested in some information coming out as long as it's not classified. They, I mean, they put their bomber aircraft and things like that, right? Actually, lots of information about the internal workings of lots of you know submarines have been inferred from their speeds, from their size, and things like that. Well, people have inferred classified things, right? So governments are kind of, yes, we'll do this if no classified information comes out, but... And you went to yeah. lens to show it's, it's, that it's okay and they can trust that, that's, it. That, that's, that's the hope. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was a question? The question is, uh, it's a little stable question, what you wanted to do about this. Uh -huh. To go about the closer so. to the bottom, the question, how do you live with this knowledge? That's right. How Let's get back to the Badly. So, so this drink is more. so last talk. <laughs> so so everything I said about after the break is about how to live with this knowledge. The way we live with this knowledge is we use at least the way I live with this knowledge is that I'm using the 
now my scientific technological knowledge and skills to try to come up with solutions that will have somehow impact this problem. This is the best I can do. I'm not the president of the United States. I don't have orange hair or orange face. And so, but I know physics, and what I can do is I can try to find ways in which I can use my skills to not apply to this, to, this, it, to, 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 to this to this problem. Huh? You, you are not thinking about the actual question they're asking. Oh. You are putting all your energy to think about something else. So you're actually distracting yourself in a way. And not facing the actual information of, hello, the world has a whole bunch of warheads. Well, I cannot change. It. I, I cannot. I cannot. I cannot destroy this cool. warhead, right? What I can do is that if some. I'm saying it doesn't answer the question. Huh? It's, it's, um, but oh, if I, you were, I I didn't, yeah. but if you were the president of the United States, all the things I've shown today uh -huh. says that you wouldn't do things any differently than they're done now. No, I would um, do. I would try would to. You? I would try to get rid of, significantly reduce the stockpile, which I think is but, important. But, but you know, that but, depends on whether Putin would agree or it doesn't. No, I don't, I don't think the United States needs to Russia's agreement. If Russians have 10,000 warheads sitting in the bunkers, the 10,000 warheads which do not have delivery system to deliver them, and let's say we have only 1,000 warheads sitting in our bunkers, there is no, that does not affect our security in any way. The only thing that affects our security is the number of the warheads that they have on their ballistic missiles and the number of their ballistic missiles. But given the probability of detonating and all of that, it's actually quite a complicated question. It's not like you... Right? Yes, yes, but that's a different this question. There's also issue about like, you know, whether you can get decoys to the right number to yeah, be able yeah. to... Like, you know, like if you have more, then you have more chances to deceive the opponent whilst you need to destroy them, and there are yeah. all sorts of issues. Like that. So, yeah, maybe. Uh, do you, what is your po what is your policy like? Let's imagine you're uh, you're elected president. I say, what is your actual president policy? Just, <laughs> it doesn't exactly. You know, because Obama didn't do it. You know, so I'll be on my golf course. Or, no, uh, what would I do differently? Yeah, exactly. I told you, I would reduce the stockpile significantly. Okay. I would reduce the risk. I would eliminate the reserve, which is completely wasteful. I would um, think I would think of ways in which um, um, I would reject some funds to port like universities like this. Uh, I would uh, think uh, in which way we can change the uh, command structure that I talked yeah, about. Yeah, you like need it, to it, reduce it, executive power. What's that? You need to reduce executive power. You, somehow you at least have to is dilute. No, no president will do it himself. Yeah, so, <laughs> so can, is there a way to dilute executive well, power? So, so, so for example, instead of having one person make, for example, can we come up with a system where three people at least have to participate. So the problems of all three of them having Alzheimer's, all three of them going insane, <laughs> is a lot, a lot, lot lower. Okay? Power to the people. Okay. So can, can we do something like, like in, think about like this. If, a, if the probability of a president having Actually, going crazy is 10%, is and if you require two more people, the combined probability of something that is happening is 100 times lower. You reduce the risk of nuclear war no, no, by 100 no, times. That's, that's people that's should give you a humanity towards it, and that was my last comment because I let it off the mic. Like, it's very last one, I promise. And you already said that. I already said that. Am I the only one who heard you say that? Raise your hand if you heard you say that. I will try the very best. Uh, basically, it's a humanity towards it. What I'm thinking, what we were talking prior in the first part of the lecture, and why you know we were laughing and I was making the stupid jokes. And I be in a way with my husband, who actually also wants to say something, which rarely ever happens. I think that really in nuclear war so much became the part not only of politics, but of literature, of popular culture, of movies. Mm -hmm. We basically live in the world that for the last 30 years, in a way, was very much dominated by the fear of the nuclear war. Mm -hmm. And I believe, honestly, that people, although all people are the same, but most of the people are not. And people know from videos, from books, from everywhere, what nuclear war is. I personally believe that no one in one's right mind, after all that we went through these years, will ever start a nuclear war. Okay, so, so let me ask you a question. Which fraction of the population are schizophrenia? Mm -hmm. Like, what, 5 to 10 percent? How are you 1%? Oh, well, but no, actually, 1%. the psychopathic so, so, leaders and positions. So, so we, we could argue that the probability <laughs> that the president, we could argue, uh, 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 argue that the probability that the president is, is, is the president has, uh, schizophrenia is 1%. Are. So you the whole world could end with a probability of 1%. That, that's enormous yeah. number. Wait, wait, you're not counting all okay, the you know commanders of submarines. What's that? There's a, yes, there's also yeah, commanders of the submarines. Yeah, yeah. So it's so, some the so, 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 so with the commanders of submarines, it's a bit more complicated uh, because the commander of submarine has to launch, uh, order a launch, and then the launch officers have to agree with that. 
So over there, it's the commander plus multiple people on Sovereign who all have to agree for a launch to happen. But, Adam, but how so, do they know? Hold on a second. What's that? How, how do they know? They get an order from the president. Yeah, so the, all of them get to verify that this order is real. After oh, okay. they verify, there's two stations on two sides of the submarine okay. where they have to turn keys at the same time. And you cannot have one person turn the key. It's, it's, it's not, it's not the, still. So the whole submarine has to go rogue. The whole submarine has to mutiny in order for some race to happen, which is quite like one person, okay. one person can essentially disrupt this. Right? Never said it's going to be the whole world. It's like one billion people, but we have four billion, so it's not the whole world. No one in the right mind can something do this. Yeah, but, but there's lots of people are not in their right mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's a lot of people who are working. They're going to drive the cars. That's a little bit of their work. They're crazy people. It's work. Look at it. What you never said. Can I ask you, maybe this is derailing things a bit, but what you made it, you know, a lot of this is about power, superpowers, and what can be done about that. What, what can be done about what I think is maybe more, just as likely right now is, you know, uh, yeah, lo lo losing control of nuclear weapons and having them wind up at someone's ISIS. hand, like ISIS. Like, there, there's plenty of crazy people, right? Yeah, so, so, so the question is how, so for example, how loose are Pakistan's, like, I, I mean... I'll tell you a story. The uh, Pakistan, so they had their... <laughs> All their arsenal in specific places that Americans found out through intelligence and stuff like that. And the Americans, like, this is, has been a real worry in the US government that they'll have an instability, the ISIS will get hold of it, the Taliban will get hold of it, and so like that. So the organ Americans organized this whole plan that in case something like that happened, there'll be this basically like desperate attack where they'll send like Navy SEALs, Team 6, and stuff like that to all those sites and try to destroy all those warheads that come out. The Pakistanis found out about this. And what they like start, Osama bin Laden went to the big power. <laughs> so, so, so what the Pakistanis started doing this, they yeah. started, they found out that Americans have such a plan, yeah. and they started moving all their arsenal <laughs> randomly around the country, <laughs> which only made it more vulnerable to what fact. Because right. if it's in one place, it's nicely guarded, but if you're moving it around, mm -hmm. it's a lot more... So the original plan, which was supposed to address this issue, actually made the whole thing actually work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so so this is that this well, is reason, factor. <laughs> this is this is the reason why I'm working on other projects on cargo security, which try to essentially the purpose is to scan screen containers mm -hmm. entering the United States and just anywhere really not only the United States for the presence of uranium piece of materials and assembled bombs. It's a very difficult problem because fifty thousand containers enter the United States every day. Okay, and screening them it has to be a technique which does not take space, is fast, has no false positives. <laughs> You know, it's cheap, you know, fits in your pocket if you talk to people who are, you know, operating those things. Yeah, but if it, if it's as this big and lead box, kind of how hmm? If it's a lead box, you see it's a lead box. Like it's rare and it'll stop it. Yeah, so it's very basic. If I have a nuclear weapon of the kind that is Russian uh, and I want to be detonated and I don't have a delivery vehicle, right? Because yeah. I just brought it in my backpack. Like, how do I do it? What do you mean? I mean, if I throw it from the atmosphere, I'm starting to go like, sorry, do I have to go really high up and really, and what do I have to do for it to actually act? You go to densely populated area, you just press the button. Also, it actually has a button associated with it. Well, it has an electrical cable. I mean, I always thought that the act of dropping it into the atmosphere... Just Google it, come on. So, 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 typically... Well, we knew that? No, typically, this is bombs, they have this thing called permissive action link. The permissive, permissive action link is essentially every warhead has a code associated with it. And what you do is that before the launch, the for the tactical ones, we're talking about small, compact. Mm -hmm. I see them are so called strategic warheads. So this was a tactical. No, no, I'm interested in the one that Pakistan right. has that can be stopped. And anyone. So they have yeah. this permissive action link that Pakistani also have that yeah. because the Americans gave them this technology. So the idea is that even if you have an enemy, you want them to have some kind of codes on their warheads. Because something that's worse than your enemy having warheads is your some random guy on the street having that warhead. You know? mm -hmm. So they, um, it's, a, it's a code that you enter, and I think that you have, suppose you have three tries, and if you, so you go wrong three times, it's, you get this partial detonation which destroys the warhead without any code. Oh, okay. so then that's 
But in principle, is there a way to circumvent it? There probably is. It can't okay. be that. Far. But it's not. It's not as easy as me grabbing it and running off somewhere. And, uh, no, you know, no, no. But what? 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 What, like, what, what can? What, what can but happen? You can is, open it up, right? Huh? What's that? You can open it up and uh, unplug some wire, right? You need like. No. no. So, so you have the actual. You have this uh, electronic thing. So, so on, on the 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 chain, the Korean thing was cool, right? Because you could sort of see it, like this thing over here. Mm -hmm. This is essentially the assembly which has electronics, which just does this synchronized detonation with these cables, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to enter into this thing, and if you enter it three times wrong, so you 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 could build your own thing which synchronize does a synchronized detonation. Yeah, you could do that, but that involves a little bit more. It's a bit hard. Um, so I cannot do. It. No, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> you can do everything. No, I understand. Like, yeah. I don't know. So, so, okay, so you want me to tell you a story? So in the, in the 60s, where people were, Dr. Strangelock came out, people were really freaking out about individual operators taking things into their hands. And they introduced this concept of a permissive action link. And this permissive action link was introduced by McNamara, who was a Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War, who turned big, you know, peace activist after he was retired and stuff like that. And in the 2000s, so that is, like, every weapon has a unique code, right? And the commander has a code in a safe later. So in the case of nuclear war, they go, they open the safe, they bring out the thing, they read it, and stuff like that. Uh, have you seen Crimson Tide? It's a pretty cool movie with uh, Denzel Washington in it, but they actually describe exactly how that's done. Apparently, I was told this actually. But the point is that they introduced the system, and then in 2000, the, someone asked, the journalist asked Mark Tamara, so what's your biggest contribution to security of America? And he says, it was the introduction of the POW, of the permissive action link that made things a lot more stable. At that point, a whistleblower from, from the the military came to him and said, do you know that all the PAL codes for the last 40 years have been set to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. <laughs> every single one. Because the military was very resistant about doing something like this, because if they had this mindset, we have to be quick, these PALs are not going to work, we're going to lose the numbers, we're gonna, the Russians are going to catch us you know, unprepared, and they said 0, 0 every single morning. Okay. So now I'm saying like, don't worry. Now it's one, 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 one. So we'll <laughs> probably have to yeah, implement it by one. Yeah. So, so the first half of your talk, you sort of mentioned that all you need is roughly ten percent or even less of, of the existing arsenal to do some real damage, right? So, so destroying the extra ones is really then change the equation. When say destroying the real ones, what do you mean? Just, just, so, so I mean, if you have a treaty and. Uh, the Russians and the Americans decide to half the arsenal. Uh -huh. the, the, the equation of sort of, of dire consequences doesn't really change. So, so here's the thing. Like, okay, so we have to go into, into actual discussion about exactly how a nuclear war would be waged. Okay. And there's this different, uh, the different types of deterrent policies or deterrent policies. There's this concept called counterforce and counterbalance. Counterforce, which is what Americans and Russians are using, implies that if you are being attacked or if you are under imminent attack, and you think that you are about, the Russians are about to hit you, you attack not their cities, but you attack all their facilities, all their ICBM sites, all their bomber aircraft bases, all their uh, naval um, some command centers and stuff like that. Right. So because there have many of them, it requires that you have many warheads to achieve that. Okay, so like in order of magnitude, it's, it's much more complicated than this. I'm sort of giving like a cartoon hand wave. If they had like thousand ICBM, you would essentially need thousand ICBM to destroy them. Okay, so if suddenly it's the same thing. Okay, if you why, why do you need ICBM to destroy ICBM? No, because how do you destroy an ICBM silo? Without... Uh, like with the whole explosion, what do you destroy it? Right? No, 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 no. Like that, you, you 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 need a. This is a fairly yeah, strongly but... underground. You have to have a strike on the ground within 200 meters and things like that. The regular sport will do. But I mean, yeah. if you look into the Second World War, it will quickly deteriorate into just bombing cities. So, so, <laughs> so right. So, so, so the, the, the worry is that the general posture is that of a counterforce. The question is that, yeah, it, at some point, this, the command center very often means places that are very close to cities. And what it means also is that, the, the prime, in this case, the primary impact on the civilian population will be through the fallout. But it wasn't um, to preserve so, the population, it was actually possible to reduce the overall yeah. bad stuff that was happening. So the, and then if you know that Russia are about to destroy you, but yeah. instead of bombing their cities, it's, it's not going to, by destroying Moscow, 
Right. Their leadership is in a, in a bunker, which will probably not fit. By killing 5 million people, you're not going to re reduce their ability to kill your own children. What you want to do is that you want to destroy their ICBMs, because they're the ones that are going to kill you, right? Russians have also the same mentality, that if we think that America will hit us, we're not going to waste our military power and killing off civilian population. It's pointless. We're going to destroy their ICBMs. So this is a so-called counter-force uh, posture. For that thing to work, both sides need to have enough numbers to destroy the other side, okay? So if for some reason you have like 100 warheads while well, they have something like 2,000 warheads, okay, then you are at a clear disadvantage in the sense that they could launch attack, which will completely destroy your 200 warheads, and then all you have are your submarines, which is a smaller number, and you end up having this asymmetry. In this game, you are going to end up losing, where at some point they'll have some, you'll run out of warheads, while they'll have enough warheads now to come after your city. So both sides have been jealously trying to keep some kind of, a, you know, this, this concept of strategic balance. They've been trying to keep the numbers comparable, which is why when I showed this thing over here, like the Americans, the Russians have roughly now comparable number of delivery, the delivery. I'm sorry, not delivery, um, deployed <laughs> deployed warheads. They really have been trying to keep it as similar as possible because of this mindset. The Chinese have a different uh, posture, and French have also had a different posture, which is called counter value, which they say that instead of destroying their ICBMs, we're just going to kill their population. We're going to literally commit genocide on them. And if we can just destroy a couple of their cities, that's enough for deterrent for them to never touch us. So counter value, in some sense, is a very, while it's immoral, sounds very immoral, at this point, there's, everything is immoral. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's, it's a more defensive posture. It's so much that we're never going to strike them. We don't need to. And we will guarantee that they never strike us by threatening their cities. Okay. American posture is quite a bit, quite a bit different. It's, it's, just, it's a much more aggressive posture in some sense. That it implies an attempt to actually carry out a first strike. Yeah. So anyway, it's a very long America answer. But it's, but it's an extremely, it's an extremely convoluted kind of, you know, Mindset, which sometimes becomes very important. But, but I, I don't even. How does it make sense? Because you are going to put so much crap in the atmosphere that you're yeah. going to basically kill everybody. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, yeah. That's so. So. That's, so. 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 The critics. So, 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 so. It doesn't even make sense. So. So. Why so. Why does so. It make sense. <laughs> so. So. The critics of the counter force strategy say that yeah, it's at the end, you know, you are not saving the civilian population. Exactly. Okay, yeah. Now you're going to kill them. Why there are more cities? So. So. so this is this is this is why I say that the moral moral advantage of counter force. This right? is really aggressive. <laughs> <strategy. laughs> building more cities. Yeah, we should build more yeah. cities in Kansas. So. So. So the notion that you know there's like a moral advantage to counter force is really BS because yes, you are not directly killing civilians, but they're going to get killed, you know, through other effects. <laughs> Yeah, it's again like always. American military was like all those precision strikes, uh, first world and second world, and then they do just bombing <laughs> with nuclear weapons, yeah. <laughs> civilians. Right. Here go. <laughs> and, you know, the story, you know, goes around. So what, like, what the real... So, so we can get pretty close to it. Yeah, 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 some shit happens. Uh, we came pretty close to it a few times. Although yeah. I mean at least three times. Yeah, where the United States and the, and the, uh, and the Russians so and the Soviets almost triggered the war. What about Pakistan and India? Huh? This is what I'm asking. As of today, right, as of 2017, what is the... Trump wants to Not lost our way to the Yeah. And, and, and is that actually happened? Is there any way to do that? What to do in case of a nuclear war? Yeah, just have a nuclear war. Yeah. <laughs> what, are you asking what to do in case of a nuclear war? Yeah. I don't have an answer. When was the last time? Try not to. I don't know. Uh, I had at some point I used to think about this. I was at some point I was thinking about this, and like the the only meaningful answer I could give myself is you should learn Portuguese. What Portuguese? Because you should move to Brazil. <laughs> because Brazil is south of the equator, and while in the northern hemisphere the temperatures will drop by thirty degrees Celsius, which means just complete complete devastation. Yeah. 
Uh, in the southern hemisphere, the temperature expected to drop by a few degrees. Like Why, not two degrees. Why not Chile? Uh, Why not Chile? Okay, fine. If you want to, okay. You don't say this, go to Chile. Yes. And start, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Everything. Huh? Oh, really? yeah. so, very far. So, so it, 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 I, I don't know. This, this is like Fine. this is like fantasy, right? So because Brazil in case of in case of a, in case yeah, of a, a nuclear, nuclear war, war, or even before nuclear war, just oh, moving around is going to be very hard. So you want to get to the closest place that is south of the equator. You know, that's Brazil, so or or you know, or Venezuela, or something like that. So do they have any developed plans to actually start the nuclear war in the whole northern hemisphere? Because that would really shift the balance of you know. Well, so so, 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 in South Hemisphere, there's like right now there's no nuclear forces, but there used to be nuclear power. South Africa had nuclear weapons for, right, for, for right, right. when Mandela came, he gave up on nuclear. Oh, Argentina right. and Brazil had nuclear weapon programs, right. which they stopped also at some point. You believe so, they stopped? Oh, we're here, yeah. last question, I swear. So, we, so, I swear, like that, but you're a Anyway, so we, so so we all pretend that Israel is not in the game. You know, they they, they like never came out of court, whatever. So what if all of a sudden they actually start shooting that stuff? Who Israelis? We'll be back. Yeah, who? It's very difficult. It's a very difficult thing to do. Go be a trip to Brazil. It's a very difficult thing. I don't know. Like if they start, it depends who they bomb. If they decide to bomb Iran. Pakistan might retaliate. I, I, it's hard to say, right? Why did they go to the states? States are in states are lies in Israel, right? That's right. Somehow yeah. worry more about Israel than North Korea. It's really it's yeah. 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 The children. The children. The children. Where are the children? No. 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 Uh, Israel, Israel, did, <laughs> Israel did try to use nuclear weapons during the Yom Kippur War. Yes, they, they essentially, it's not clear whether they were seriously <laughs> contemplating using nuclear weapons, but they at least threatened to the Americans. They went to Kissinger, and Kissinger went to, who was that then, Nixon, and told Nixon that, uh, that uh, Israel's are about to go nuclear. And essentially, sort of, Israel's managed to blackmail Americans to give them lots of aid. In the return from, in the return to not using nuclear weapons, because what happens at the beginning of the war is Israel had all their tank forces destroyed, and they will had a real shortage of tank forces against the it was a real superiority of the, the Egyptians in the tank forces, and the Americans gave them a significant number of like Sherman's patents and things like that, and apparently the way they managed to convince yeah. the Americans to do that yeah. was by saying that either you guys do it or we have mm -hmm. no choice but to use nuclear weapons. Whether that was a credible Credible kind of threat. I don't know. I think I think if, if Egyptians had overrun Israel and started killing the Jewish population, yeah. they would probably have used it. But if uh, Egyptians had simply come up to the Israeli border, to yeah. the Gaza Strip, and stopped and simply have taken the Sinai Peninsula, yeah. I don't think Israelis would be us instead to put insane to make people weapons. No, we're done. <laughs> 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 Yes, yeah, geez, thanks. So